Sure thing. Roll call. Council Member Harris. Here. Council Member Jeruso. Council Member King. Council Member Green. Council Member Thomas. We do not have a quorum. That's okay. Well, um, I know they had a utility meeting that went long. So why don't we get started so we're not holding everybody up. Um, this is recorded and can be accessed uh, later today. It's also being um, streamed. I do wanna say good afternoon to everyone here. Um, today is Wednesday, October 26th, and it is the eighth Quality of Life Committee meeting for 2022. Today's meeting will focus entirely on homelessness initiatives from outreach services to cleanup efforts. This is one of my top priorities, and I, in my office, have continued to work closely with the administration, advocates, nonprofits, residents, and the business community to come up with some solutions um, to bring about progress. I just wanna point out some of the things that my office has done. This is not a promotional thing for my office, but I do want people to understand that we work on this issue literally every single day. Um, so since I've taken office, um, we have advocated for tranche two of ARP dollars to partially fund a homelessness consultant to create a plan to address homelessness and streamline and coordinate existing services. Um, we have, been in ongoing uh, talks with Clutch Consulting founder, Mindy Chapman Semple, who spearheaded the effort to drastically reduce homelessness in Houston, Texas. And she actually has confirmed her dates. So we'll get those over to you, Dr. Vagno and everyone else because she's coming to New Orleans to um, just get the lay of the land. We've also worked with the Rise Up Coalition uh, to talk about alternatives to the low barrier shelter, because sometimes the shelter, the low barrier shelter is not palatable to some folks who are out um, on the street. We've also proposed and received funding for a homeless czar to coordinate city services that will be embedded within the city. Um, and they will implement the citywide plan to address homelessness. We've engaged in ongoing meetings with business owners and residents near their Calliope Quarter, We've walked the Claiborne and Calliope corridor with unity um, to understand current conditions, talk to people who are living there and the services that unity provides. Um, we've met with Tulane University, the VA director, Hope House, the Harry Thompson Center, and other organizations to explore partnerships um, for additional services and collaboration. And so these are just a few of the things that we've been working on. It's not an easy, issue to get your arms around. And I know I received um, an email about an article today of some efforts in Baton Rouge um, that they're doing. Um, and that, you know, quite frankly, reading the article, I don't know how effective they will be um, in their ordinance to basically criminalize street homelessness. Um, and so I think that we have to take a, an approach that works not only for the folks who are out there, but for our business community and people who live in neighborhoods. We don't wanna simply push people to uh, other areas. Um, we wanna make sure that they have a place to go. And so with that, I will turn it over um, to, oh, Council Member Green, hello, how are you? Uh, with that, our first presentation is from uh, Dr. Begno, Director of the New Orleans Health Department and Taylor. Um, Taylor, I forget your title. Uh environmental health officer, health and homelessness lead. Perfect. And um, Tyler has, Taylor has worked uh, diligently, I know with my office, to try to get this presentation together. So why don't we start with you all? Yeah. And um, just a reminder, uh, we will take questions from and comments from the audience limited to two minutes per person. Um, and if you want to submit comments online, we will also read those onto the record. So thank you. Great. I just wanna thank you, um, Council Member Harris and the committee for having us here again. We've been here before. Um, we are always happy to provide updates on what we're doing either in the public, in the community, working with businesses and our providers and then behind the scenes. Um, I'm, I'm gonna do the slide uh, advancing today. I'm excited to turn the presentation over to Taylor. You know, Councilman Green, you talk about the city being a great place to work. We attract top-notch talent um, because we work on really complex things. And so we, you know, you're gonna see an example of that right, right here. Um, so Taylor, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, council members. I would like to begin by just briefly discussing what the health department's role in addressing homelessness is uh, and what it is not. 
quite honestly, our role is actually quite small. Uh, we have a, a number of programs that help uh, with some direct services, but my work specifically is focused on addressing public health hazards in uh, area homeless encampments. Uh, we sort of coordinate and conduct these cleanings on a weekly basis, um, and that, that is sort of the focus of, of my role. Um, um, importantly, what we do not do is housing, case management, or wraparound services. Those are the tools that we know that will end homelessness, and that, that is not an area of work that the health department engages in, directly at least. Um, what we do do is focus on harm reduction in uh, homeless encampments. We focus on reducing health hazards for those who are living unsheltered and their surrounding community. We also use our cleanings as an opportunity to connect folks who are living on the streets with appropriate services. Uh, I'll go into more detail about that later on, uh, but that, that is something that we have, really do take, take pride in doing while we're out there. Um, so I wanna go into some specifics about what our public health sanitation process actually looks like. Um, so we know that we clean the largest encampment areas in the city on a regular basis. Those are along the Claiborne and Calio corridors. Uh, we also use the city's 311 system to identify smaller encampments throughout the city. That's a great opportunity for your constituents as well as your staff members to uh, keep us in the loop with uh, homeless issues as they arise so we can sort of keep everything organized. That's something you've uh, probably heard from us already and we'll continue to hear uh, moving forward. Um, the cleanings themselves are, are actually pretty straightforward. Um, residents are allowed to keep items that are considered personal property and uh, the health department in coordination with the Department of Sanitation and NOPD removes any items in an encampment that may be considered a health hazard. Um, I, I really wanna emphasize this last point on the slide that under the ordinance, the default, if we're unsure about whether an item should be considered a hazard or personal property, that the default is for us to treat the item as if it is personal property and that it should remain. Uh, so if there's ever questions about why we're leaving something, it's probably because it sort of is in the middle ground and we're deciding to treat it as the default as personal property. Um, the, the hazards that we remove um, include things like used syringes, anything with human or rodent waste, um, things that are obviously, you know, trash or garbage like spoiled food. Um, another area of emphasis for us is potential fire hazards. Uh, we've had a number of fires break out in encampments across the city, so we want to be really sure that uh, there's no damage to any DOTD uh, highway property um, or that anyone is, you know, at excess risk of, of of, uh, of fire. Um, something else that we get a lot of questions about are mattresses and, and pieces of furniture. Um, we have found that those provide an opportunity for rodent harborage and pest harborage. So uh, rats really like to burrow in there, uh, make a home. So we got to make sure that those are, are getting out um, and, and are, are disposed. So um, those, are, those are things that we hear about all the time. Oh, there's a mattress out there. That is something that we will dispose if we see it. Um, I, I do want to take this opportunity to uh, shout out the Department of Sanitation, uh, Matt Tori and his team. They do incredible work for us. Uh, they are uh, really, really great partners, and we would not be nearly as successful as we are without their uh, compassion and understanding uh, while we're doing this work. I also really want to uh, thank our partners at Unity. Uh, we try to use our cleanings as an opportunity for service providers to come out uh, and directly engage with residents. And Unity has been an incredible partner sending their outreach teams out to engage with folks, get them signed up for housing services and any other services that they might need. Uh, and that is just a, an enormous help for us. It helps build trust among the community uh, and helps get folks on the path to finding housing. Um, so this is what a, a typical encampment might look like when we arrive. Um, you know, pretty, uh, not the best conditions, um, but after we're done, uh, it looks a whole lot better. Um, now, and this is a situation where the uh, individuals who were living here actually had moved. Uh, so we were able to remove everything that had remained. We knew where they had gone to. Um, un un under a normal circumstance, if folks had moved any personal property, let us clean, and it looks like this when we leave, uh, 
those residents are able to return to this spot and have their property remain. So you might hear us say, oh, you know, we just cleaned the Calio corridor last week. Uh, and your constituents might ask, well, there are still tents there. Did you actually do anything? And we did. Um, we're just not allowed to uh, remove items that are considered personal property. And the ordinance specifies that tents are in fact personal property. Um, that is not something that we can dispose unless it has an immediate health hazard. That would be uh, what we find most of the time with tents is that it's rodents. Uh, folks have food stored inside their tent, rodents make their way inside going after the food and the tent becomes a health hazard and then we remove it. And I, I'll just add, uh, uh, you know, the practical, we, we do abide by the constraints of the ordinance and, you know, to do otherwise, of course, would not be allowable. But the practical reality is that if you remove a tent, another one will come up immediately in, in your place. So you're really chasing your tail. And um, in terms of things like that, um, so we do clean, we clean around, we clean underneath anything that is obviously soiled or an obvious hazard is removed because it is no longer personal property. But as Taylor said, the default in the ordinance is that everything else is. Um, we have, uh... In the last year or so, our cleaning operations have been uh, much more successful than they used to be in the past. And uh, that is almost entirely due to uh, the health department's increased outreach efforts. Um, you know, under the ordinance, we are only required to place notice of a cleaning operation 24 hours in advance. Uh, we have made it our internal policy to go out at least the week before to let folks, let folks know exactly the date that we're gonna be coming. Uh, that also gives us an opportunity to identify hazards early uh, so we can start having conversations with folks of, you know, if this looks this way, when we arrive next week, it's something we have to dispose. Um, so that come Wednesday morning when we come clean, no one's surprised, um, no, no one is shocked, we can actually have a pretty smooth operation. Um, that, that has made uh, our uh, our efforts much, much smoother. Uh, this year alone, our staff has put 400 staff hours into outreach efforts, um, and that, that has made things much, uh, much better for us. Um, part of the, the assistance in all of our outreach efforts are our um, external partners, which we've listed here. Uh, these are only some of them. Uh, without them, again, you know, we, don't, we don't do our work alone, and uh, if we tried to do so, we would not be nearly as successful as we are. Um, so I want to just wanted to list them uh, to give them the appropriate credit um, to hold ourselves accountable. Every summer we conduct customer service, uh, customer satisfaction surveys uh, with the folks who are living in encampments to uh, sort of get their feedback about how the cleanings are going. Uh, this year we uh, surveyed 50 individuals living in encampments uh, and got some really, really good feedback. Um, you can see here uh, we ask. The, the first question, do the cleanings make your area safer and more sanitary, which is the entire purpose of our work, uh, and 48 out of the 50 respondents said yes. Uh, that is an improvement from last year and something that we are uh, particularly proud of. Um, the folks living out there also know that uh, the cleanings are necessary. We got pretty high marks on that. Uh, we do find that uh, generally folks don't like waking up super early to uh, deal with a huge sanitation crew. Uh, which is understandable. I don't like being awake early in the morning either. Um, so we get pretty good marks on how necessary the cleanings are, uh, but see a little bit of a dip uh, rating the overall experience. Uh, here we got some data about some of the important tools to end homelessness. Uh, the first being um, uh, having a caseworker to help you navigate the sort of uh, complicated system to get folks into housing. Uh, and we see that there is a uh, roughly 50-50 split between those who do have a caseworker who's helping them uh, and those who are sort of trying to navigate this on their own. Um, perhaps even more troubling, we find that 66% uh, of the people that we spoke to are not interested in staying at a shelter in New Orleans. Uh, the last time I was here presenting to council, a council member asked why that is. Uh, and I sort of had to shrug my shoulders and say, you know, anecdotally, we know we've, we've heard some things, uh, but we didn't have a, a really solid answer as to why. Uh, so we are hoping to change that and give you an actual uh, significant and solid answer. Uh, so we've begun a, a second survey and interview process. Um, it's uh, a project about barriers to accessing emergency shelters. We, um, uh, what we have here listed is sort of the core of the issue. Uh, 
Uh, we did the uh, pit count, the annual census of how many people are living homeless in uh, the greater New Orleans area, and found that about 364 people uh, this past February were living unsheltered. Uh, this October, October 2nd, the weekly shelter report came out and there were 381 beds available in area shelters. Now, I do have an asterisk here because a good chunk of those beds are at the low barrier shelter. Um, if you recall, the low barrier shelter increased from 100 beds to 346 uh, this past summer. Um, about, uh, they filled up about 100 of, of those beds over the course of a month. Uh, but about 146 now at about 130 still remain open, uh, but they are unavailable because of staffing issues. Uh, the low barrier shelter does not have enough staff to uh, ensure that the residents occupying those beds have a uh, safe and comfortable experience. So that is a pretty big chunk here of this 381, but that does mean that there are about 250 other beds in emergency shelters in New Orleans that are currently being unutilized. Um, a, if we were to resolve either of those numbers, uh, we would see a dramatic decrease in the unsheltered homeless populations. Uh, and that is something that the health department has an extremely vested interest in. Um, so what this project is going to look like, we are conducting surveys with uh, as many people living unsheltered as possible. Our uh, goal is 200. And then uh, on top of that, we are interviewing anybody who has stayed even one night at an emergency shelter. So these are folks who are currently living on the streets that have stayed at least one night uh, at a shelter and are now on the streets again. Um, so we, we're gonna survey them with some basic questions and then interview them about their experience uh, at whatever shelter they attended. Um, at the same time, we're gonna be interviewing uh, shelter staff and managers to better understand their policies and procedures uh, so we can sort of match what the rules and regulations are and then what the perceptions of the shelters are among the unsheltered population. So uh, up, up to now, we have conducted 177 surveys with those living unsheltered uh, and 91 subsequent interviews. So we're most of the way there uh, as far as our data collection. Uh, and so I wanted to share just a little bit of our initial findings. There's gonna be a much more robust report uh, that we're going to be putting together, but this is just some of the initial stuff that we found um, at a quick glance. The first being that uh, almost 100 people uh, that we have talked to have stayed at a shelter in New Orleans and are on the streets. Um, that's, uh, I, I don't want to make any judgments about that yet, um, but that is a, a pretty striking number. Um, we spoke to the, we asked the 43% who hadn't stayed at a shelter um, why, and what we heard a lot was uh, first about sort of personal preference, about not wanting to be living in a congregate setting, um, since that's what the option is at area shelters. Uh, we heard about um, restrictive rules, about not being able to come and go when you please, only being able to check in at a certain time, not being able to leave for work, um, as well as uh, concerns about conditions, hearing that um, you know, it might not be safe, um, the conditions themselves might be poor, uh, staff treatment might be an issue. Um, so those are the things that people are talking about uh, that are preventing folks from even trying to go to a shelter. That's not even what folks have experienced. That's just what people have heard. Um, of the interviews that we have done with folks who have stayed at a shelter and, and now are not, uh, we've done 91 of those interviews. Only seven of those people so far have told us that they found a housing placement either through a housing program or staying with family. That means the overwhelming majority of folks who uh, are who have gone to a shelter and are on the streets um, did not get placed into housing, uh, which again, I, I don't want to make a statement about yet, but um, that is uh, a, a number of interests that, that we should be paying attention to. Um, here are some quotes uh, that we've heard based on some themes that we've identified early. Um, the first one being about the need for shelters to have supportive services to uh, help with job placement, um, medical treatment, uh, help with uh, mental illness. We have uh, identified a theme of folks feeling disrespected by uh, shelter staff and that sort of being a big turnoff that makes them, uh, makes them rather uh, be outside. Um, Again, like I mentioned before, the need for flexible scheduling, personal preference, having a place to call your own. Um, and we've had a number of people reference shelters uh, as if they were prison. 
um, they, I, they said that it felt like being in jail. Uh, and, that's, and that's something that is uh, definitely not what we're going for. Um, so based off of this, you know, like I said, we're gonna have a much more robust report, um, hopefully by early 2023. Uh, but just based on our initial findings, we have some recommendations here. Uh, the first being that, you know, shelters with barriers uh, are a problem. Um, that, that if we can lower those barriers, make recommendations as needed to area shelters to increase that utilization, that would be a huge help. Uh, the other piece, as I alluded to previously, the low barrier shelter, if we get that staffed up, uh, that's, you know, 130 people into shelter. Uh, that would be a, a huge, huge help. Um, like I said, you know, when they expanded, it took about a month from expansion to when those, they, until they met their capacity. Uh, we believe that if we get that staff in place, uh, we can fill every single one of those beds. Um, and, and that would be a huge, huge help. Uh, additionally, we wanna recommend that uh, the city and, and council look at alternative shelter models. Like I said, the only, th the only option for folks right now is congregate living. Um, we think it might be worthwhile to explore things like hotels, tiny homes, et cetera, um, to give folks different options to sort of meet folks where they're at uh, and, and make sure that their needs are being met because right now the shelter system as it exists is inadequate to meet those needs. Um, I wanna end today uh, with going back to our cleaning process uh, and go over a few recommendations that we have based on the cleaning ordinance, what we think uh, would be helpful for uh, our cleaning operations. The first one being uh, removing the requirement that the city store uh, personal property uh, right now, under ordinance, if we see personal property, we are required to uh, document it, transport it to a different place for storage for up to 30 days where it can be claimed. Um, and then after that 30 days, those items can be disposed. We have found that that is uh, not only impractical uh, for staff to be taking the time to uh, sift through all of those belongings, um, we have found that, uh, you know, we, we don't have the storage space, quite frankly, we don't have the equipment to move all of these belongings. We also think it's ineffective. Like Dr. Vegno mentioned earlier, if we move, remove all of these belongings uh, to put into storage, they can uh, either, you know, under ordinance be claimed right away and nothing will have changed except inconveniencing someone who's uh, already struggling or uh, those items can be replaced uh, and we haven't really solved anything. So it's, it's uh, more of an inconvenience to the unsheltered than it is um, anything else. Uh, so we would, uh, we would want that uh, requirement to be removed. Uh, additionally, we have run into a number of issues. Um, I know uh, members, council members Green and King, you, uh, there's an instance of uh, over by the Charbonnet Funeral Home uh, there is an empty lot, a vacant lot that uh, folks have come onto and built uh, a sort of small encampment on a private lot. Uh, and the health department can only clean on public property and code enforcement uh, isn't able to address any uh, uh, homeless structures on the lot. They can only deal with the long grass. So we think it would be important for um, code enforcement to in some capacity be able to better address uh, any public health issues on a private lot. Um, so that would be something that we, we would be interested in exploring. Uh, and finally, you know, I alluded to this previously that, you know, any item that isn't posing a health hazard is something that we generally treat as public property. Uh, that has led to some encampments that have a significant amount of scrap metal and bike parts um, that's, that sort of exists in that gray area of having personal value, um, but not necessarily being personal property. So we don't necessarily want to eliminate having those uh, full stop uh, because there is value. Um, there is economic value of being able to uh, sell scrap metal, but we don't, it ends up where we have some encampment areas that are these extremely large sort of sprawling areas of scrap metal and bike parts uh, that, uh, that can create hazards in themselves. So just having some specificity about what um, we can or can't do in that instance uh, would be extremely helpful. Um, but ultimately what I want to end on is that, you know, like I said at the top, what we do does not solve homelessness. We know the things that solve homelessness are affordable housing, mental health treatment, addiction services, 
and any sort of wraparound case management to make sure that folks who are placed in long-term housing programs can be successful. Um, so that's that's really where we need to be investing uh, uh, our efforts. Um, what we do is a band-aid to make sure that while the folks are out there, they have as, as safe and sanitary a place to live as possible, uh, and that uh, disease doesn't spread amongst the unsheltered or their surrounding community. Um, so, uh, like I said, th those sorts of investments in housing, mental health care, addiction services is really, really where we want to be. Um, and that is all we have for you. We'd be happy to stand for questions. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Uh, Council Member Thomas, followed by Council Member Green, then Council Member Teresa. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for your presentation. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Dunham and uh, Martha Cagle from Unity for the meeting we had yesterday. Uh, I think everyone's trying to get a better understanding uh, of this issue and and how it's actually starting to grow in it, every neighborhood. Uh, it used to be that there were certain parts of urban corridors and certain parts of the cities where you, you could see the unhoused. Uh, but now it's uh, no area too far, wherever there's a vacant spot or, or empty uh, piece of property. Uh, one of the things that, that, that I'd like to ask is that a, a couple of decades ago, uh, there was a proposal legacy project that was a partnership with the downtown development district, the business community, as well as city government that never got off the ground. And it had it talked about a plot of land or piece of uh, parcel of land downtown uh, where you would have the unhoused and where you would have wraparound services that would concentrate in that area. I think there was a time uh, when some cities were at work, uh, the Orlando project, San Diego, and I think uh, Seattle had some success. And then of course the population started to go down. Now we're seeing it go up again. And as we talk about these effective uh, strategies, uh, those of us who move around uh, see that there's some tension and there's some conflict, especially in communities that aren't used to that population setting up stake or setting up uh, their residence or domicile in that area. And the tensions and feelings are starting to kind of boil over. What are, what are the strategy because you know folks say you want to be sensitive to the unhoused but that business person or that person who lives in that community what about them and their family well, you know what about the sensitivity to them running their business or going into their subdivision what about that sensitivity and right now feelings are are at an all-time high because those businessmen who came down here and as you guys know, you know I'm, I'm kind of infamous now uh, for trying to clean up an area in our community. I, you know, I, I know you don't confront people anymore. I'm not qualified for that. But there's just an effort to remove someone's junk from the entrance to where we live. How are we dealing with that? Because if we don't begin to deal with that real soon, it, it, people's livelihood and people's quality of life are being impacted. And while we care about making sure we take care of people who for whatever reason can't take care of themselves, I think there should probably be the same feeling about the people who are trying to run their business and take care of their family. Yeah, I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. And I think we have to balance the short-term tensions with the long-term solution. There is a short-term mitigation band-aid, as Taylor said, that we can do. The earlier that we're aware of a new encampment, whatever it is being set up on public property, again, just public property. I think we have to hold landlords accountable for setting up on private property that they're not maintaining. But on public property, if you call 311, our team goes out, brings someone from Unity as much as we can to get that person started in the process to say, where, where can you go, right? Mm -hmm. The thing is, there are not adequate places to, for folks to go. So that is the simultaneous long-term investment, right? We can clean, we can throw away all the trash. Sanitation, in addition to what they do for our weekly cleanings, they also go out and pick up trash all the time. But again, there is that the short-term tension belies the long-term strategic comprehensive approach that has been lacking 
as you said, for a very long time. I think we've had pieces of it. We've made moves, but then we have failed to fund a systemic, coordinated business, civic leader, nonprofit, and governmental partnership to truly identify the problem so that you don't have people moving out into your district or your district. But, but in the short term, you, you affect my business's ability to be able to do business. And in the short term, you affect the quality of life in my neighborhood. Right. But under under the ordinance and under law, you know, the health department, now other agencies can speak to what they do. There is the health department. There there is no removal of people from public property that is not allowable either under the ordinance or in the current interpretation of the law. So that, I think, is where the tension you're talking about is. And we're not the ones to figure out where the, the middle road is. That brings me to another another point. Uh, I well, I don't remove people, but I remove stuff. Mm -hmm. And me and some of my neighbors, we're committed to removing stuff. Uh, and I, I was told by someone that it's against the law to remove uh, 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 houseless or unhoused people's stuff, even if it's blocking entrance to my community. So it has my to business or it's forming a junk pile. So on public property, it has to be noticed 24 hours ahead of time. And that is, again, both our local ordinance and that is in keeping with consistent with legal decisions elsewhere. And uh, I would add that, you know, we we have a so you can build a junk, a junk, a junk heap pile. Right. Uh, right at the entrance to my subdivision or right at the entrance to Mr. Charbonnet's business. Or, on pu we're talking or, about public or, property. On public, yeah, public. Yeah. Well, you could, you could block those vendors or folk who set up under the, the so, bridge for decades, and we can't move this, that, st that so stuff. If, if anything is posing an immediate obstruction, that is something that we can remove. Uh, but again, it's that definition of what is public property versus what is a hazard. Um, you know, if it's, causing anything that we identify as a health hazard, we will absolutely remove it. We have, um, we were on a every week cleaning schedule. Um, we try to get to the Claiborne corridor, the Calia corridor and the Chapatulis area uh, once a month. Uh, those are the biggest encampment areas and have the most severe public health issues. What about Algiers and New Orleans East? Uh, so, well, uh, yeah, so the, those are on uh, uh, sort of an as needed basis as we identify, as mm -hmm. we get through the 301 system or through your office, uh, that something has popped up. We get out there, we inspect it, we add it to our list. Uh, we have had to move to an every other week cleaning schedule due to NOPD staffing shortages. We cannot do this job without NOPD sanitation, our community partners. Right. Um, and so we're sort of at the mercy of okay. other agents. I'm going to add one last thing and I'm going to be done. Uh, you know, there's some value in being from a community and growing up in the neighborhood and having a diverse life. And a lot of times there are people who are, uh, are experts or advocates for a certain group and they shine their halo, right? or they think they know it all about that community or that particular field. When, when those of us who come from that community, who have diverse families, who've kind of lived in those places and kind of talk to people who know what's, what's going on, there's some, there's some other dynamics that are, that are happening with the unhoused who we dearly in mental health, who we dearly need to take care of. Uh, right now, if you crush if you crush a fentanyl pill, if, if, if you crush a fentanyl pill, right? It, it is, because of its potency, it is worth, could be worth several hundred or several thousand dollars out there in terms of the drug market. And the, the drug market right now, in terms of how cheap it is, is exploding in this city. And there, there are more than there's battles over that income that comes from a population now, whether it's mental health or chemical dependency right now, that is fueling a lot of the violence and some of the disturbance that's happening in our community. And it, it is always, it's almost to me like many advocates, they don't, they don't understand that. Especially with some of our families, when our family members getting caught in crossfires, that's about drugs. 
that's about cheap pills. You care about this population, but then they have money. They have access to stuff that fuels this. And so if you're talking about a holistic strategy, right? I think we need to understand all of this. Nobody should just shine their halo like they care more. What we ought to do is understand that its impact has an overall impact that's fueling a whole nother dynamic that's happening in our community. And it's like, it's like everybody wants you, well, if you're not for this, then you're against this. No, maybe I'm for, maybe I'm for my family member's life. Is it okay for me to be for that? Because they got caught in a drug war over cheap pills cheap fentanyl, is it okay for me to be for that? Then not I'm not I'm against somebody who I know needs a house and some help. And we're not having the kind of this holistic discussion that solves that. Because today, either you either you you for somebody or you have this level of sensitivity or you're not. They're not thinking about the ramifications or, or what happens because of that one individual that one encampment, that one spot. And so what I'm gonna ask everybody to do is stop shining their halos, stop having the degree of who cares more than the other, and let's take a comprehensive holistic look from people who need homes to the violence that's being created because of the cheap dope that's on the street right now and the access to cash and territory. I'm not telling you what I think I know. Because many of the people who advocate, they can't have this conversation with the, with the drug dealer or the person who might shoot a couple people or the relative who's in the game and stop pitting us against each other because I care more about this group than you. But let's work holistically together with, I, I know our chairman, want, and I'm sorry, uh, chairwoman, but this, the spinoff from this thing is, it, 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 it's critical right now. And unless we begin to help and deal with this population, it's exploding again right now. And if we don't deal with it holistically and in the interim, short term, more lives and more violent acts are gonna be part of what we don't do with this issue. That's a fact. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Green. It's always gonna be a very difficult issue to discuss, but um. As I come here today, I come here reminded of a story that was told of me by someone who lives near the overpass between um, St. Bernard and Elysian Fields. And um, if you walk that area, you find a lot of pink needles. Too many. It happens all the time because it's dark and because they get no attention. But a resident near there told me of a couple that was unhoused that lived in a tent, but they chose to live in a darker area for whatever reason, and that they were addicted to drugs. Well, unfortunately, the word was that the couple went into the community and took a little something from somebody else, a few other people. And unfortunately, one day they both got shot to death in their tent. You're familiar with that case. I am. And that's very, very tragic. That is an example of why no one should pit anyone against anyone else and think that they have more compassion for somebody else than someone else does who's concerned about this matter. When Councilman King and I sponsored this event, and I just want our other district council members to know that it was just because it dealt with the Claiborne Corridor. I fully recognize the concerns that we're having near the convention center near New Orleans East on the West Bank, but it was just done there because we had a request of members of that community because some of them are being driven out of business. Now that's a business side. I mean, but those who are hostile will always say, oh, you're just concerned about business. You're not concerned about people. No, they go hand in hand. But that couple is the couple that I'll always use because if they had gotten help and weren't trying to go around and get materials so that they could, um, I'm, gonna just, I'm not gonna jump to conclusions. So I will just say, but they got killed in a dark area under St. Bernard Avenue. I also wanna recognize that sometimes it's very frustrating for the private sector and we'll look at our ordinance, but the lot that you mentioned, for example, on Claiborne Avenue is owned by someone 
who can't do much. You can't go onto a private lot and move someone um, on your own without a great deal of difficulty. Maybe it's the ordinance, but at the end of the day, just as you said, they can return. So all I'm asking is, of course, that we have compassion and recognition on both sides. You can be concerned about those who are unhoused, while at the same time being concerned about those who have livelihoods that are impacted or who have property values that are impacted by the fact that there is a situation near them that needs to have addressed. We talk about support of um, African-American businesses and how important it is, and it is. On Claiborne Avenue, there are a couple of African-American businesses who've had to go out of business, for example, the reception hall, because you don't have any place for people to park. And the view across the street is not what you want. Within the negative, I want to say a positive, but I do want you all to address a couple of things. Is anybody keeping a record of amongst the homeless, the unhoused population of deaths and rates of injury due to disease that amongst that occur amongst these 400 people who are identified as being unhoused? Yep. So there's been efforts to do this. Um, we've met with the coroner a few times um, because they're really the ones who can track the deaths most um, most consistently, although there's, there's a lot of, of challenge there. You might not know if someone is homeless. Maybe they've been homeless for 20 years, but the night they died, they happen to be sleeping in a hotel room where they still homeless, all that. Um, they had agreed to track that and send us regular reports. That was right before COVID. They have not had the capacity to do that since. So we will continue to, you know, we will continue to, to request that because we do believe that will help us get more information. There are some informal counts. Um, in December every year, there's an interfaith service to honor the homeless deaths. And, and they're, they receive, they have a list of names, whether that's the real list, not clear. The point is to just to shed some light. Um, we do know national data. It's pretty clear. Could you give me an approximate number of oh, that they recognize? Oh gosh, I'm trying. To, it's December fifth. I can give you one. Then um, I will say anywhere from forty to sixty a year. I couldn't say uh, roughly deaths. Um, we we know for sure that being homeless decreases your life expectancy significantly, increases rates of all kinds of traumatic disease. It is it is a clear social determinant of health that has an absolute negative outcome, um, no question. And that's true for homelessness across the board, but is, a, is even, uh, even worse for those who are living unsheltered, um, which is why part of why we have such a, an emphasis on unsheltered populations. Right. And our Healthcare for the Homeless Clinic is designed, it doesn't only see homeless people, but that is its mission. And it has case managers wrap around, we do medication assisted treatment because Councilman Thomas, I couldn't agree with you more that addiction treatment is a cornerstone. So we have a specialty clinic to care for this population, even then getting them to go, keeping them in, providing all the supports that help them stay in treatment, engaging in primary care. We know we can do more for them, um, but it is not just the health department who can do it alone. Absolutely, I understand that. Yeah. And we wanna achieve the solutions, you know, very honestly, and you all may have to suggest it to us, but I'll just state on the record, 40 to 60, and it's ironic, you know, look how much of a range, it could be 30% one way, you know, or the other, but the bottom line is that 40 to 60 people who are unhoused may pass away each year on the streets of New Orleans. That's very sad. There are also people who are engaged in crimes that are the victims of crimes. I should say that more than anything else. Mm -hmm. There are people who are the victims of crime because there's nobody to watch and help them. Mm -hmm. And we need to pay attention to that too. And I know that we do. Um, this discussion is certainly long overdue. I didn't even tell you what, um, what I really wanted to say about Councilman King and I, because I, wanted, I was almost apologetic to our other council members, but we were criticized for even discussing, I was at least, criticized for even discussing the issue. Because being unhoused is not a crime. Don't call it not, don't call it homeless, call it unhoused. But the main thing was, is that whoever said that, I asked the question, well, what would you do? And the problem is, I think a lot of people think that right now, the way that things are, 
is fine because they don't hear about it. But I'm glad that you all are here from the health department to talk about the deaths. I don't, I shudder to think what the difference is in the rate of infection by certain diseases based on the lack of sanitary conditions. Where does someone defecate? Where does someone urinate when they're living inside of a tent? It's a serious issue in our city that anyone who is compassionate about that population of people needs to recognize that we can't leave things the way they are. Yes, maybe we should build a large shelter that has easy access in and out. And I'm open to that, you know, very honestly. But I think that we certainly need to leave this discussion that we have today, recognizing that with 40 to 60 deaths with high rates of um, drug over addiction and abuse by criminals, that we have to do something about that. I don't have a conclusion, except that I think that my conclusion is, is that this is an issue that we should not let wane anymore. If we have to go to the state to get money, if we have to go to, if we have to go to capital to get money and find a way to operate the right facilities. But we also have to look into that issue of 66% of the people that you talk to not wanting to go to a shelter at all. Whatever education we can do, we have got to let people know that that is resulting in them not being safe. They're being very unsafe because of that. And I know how hard it is. And I know that, for example, my fellow councilman and I have done the same, have walked and have talked to people along Claiborne Avenue. And yes, they will tell you that they don't want to go into a shelter. I'll tell you from experience that I'm in a business where we once had a couple of tenants who were in a property where Unity of, Great, of Greater New Orleans was paying their rent um, and utilities. And they were able to provide themselves with um, food stamps or food coupons. But because there was an inspection required once a week, that person chose to leave and go back to the streets. I don't know where that person is now, but it's a very, very sad story. So we have to be considerate and compassionate on all sides with those who are being victimized by actually being in the population of the unhoused, those who are being victimized because they're more subject to crime and also disease. We also have to be concerned about those who are impacted because there are some people who are impacted and in the scheme of things, it's not fair to them. It's not fair to have your property occupied and have nothing, have no recourse. It's not fair for your business to be driven out of business because you can't do business under that corridor, especially Claiborne. The cement is there because of the displacement of a black community and the business owners were supposed to be able to use that parking to help their businesses make up for the fact that so much had been taken from them. I would like to conclude with something very positive. I would like to applaud the, oh, first, I'm sorry, there's one other thing that I want to say. The Housing Authority of New Orleans is about to open up its roles to allow for more housing assistance voucher program vouchers to be available. I hope that the health department or that the, um, at that Unity or whomever it might be, community organizations, and I'm going to do so, will go to as many people as possible to encourage them to apply for the certificates so that they can potentially be of, have access to healthy dwellings that could help prolong their health and help us as a city. So um, that voucher program opens in early November. I would appreciate your help or telling me who we need to direct to do that so that we can interview those folks and tell them. That may be, interestingly enough, one of the partial solutions because there you're in dwellings that you can come and go as you want. I hope that that is something that you all will take. You gotta let me know how we can help with that. But I do wanna end with this very positive note. A lot of people criticize the New Orleans Police Department mainly because they focus on what they see in the media and don't know a lot of other developments that happen within that department. I wanna commend the New Orleans Police Department crisis intervention team because for a couple of months, my office, was very concerned about a young lady who was sleeping on a neutral ground at Gentilly and Chef Ventura Highway. Sleeping on a neutral ground that was so narrow that if she rolled one way or the other, she could be run over by a vehicle. There were people who said that they didn't see her there at night because she would sit on the side and do not much else. She also, 
um, was engaged in some practices that weren't very healthy in terms of across the street where she might have used the bathroom, but she was approached many times by family members and also by representatives of a community group, which actually works right across the street from her, but she didn't want to take advantage of that. But because of the thoughtful concerns of the New Orleans Police Department's crisis intervention team, specifically Sergeant Aaron Harrelson and Captain DeLarge of the third district, Robin Birchfield, of the New Orleans Emergency Medical Services, a patient advisor, patient advocate, also the New Orleans Health Department, Tim Murphy, mm -hmm. the Department of Sanitation, which cleaned up afterwards, and also the Tulane University Forensic Psychiatrist area, where they provided assistance to this um, young lady, someone who was in danger of being hit by a vehicle and also in health dangers now is receiving care, psychiatric care. And I understand that it could be for up to a month. That is a good news story. Someone who, in my opinion, would have been subject to great peril over time because eventually it was gonna happen. She was gonna roll off the neutral ground into the street. But I do wanna say this, I'm concerned about the fact that the prognosis for treatment is that she may be able to get psychiatric care for up to a month. What is the up to the month limit? In this society, in this city, if it takes more than that, we've got to find a way to do it. And I don't have the answers as a council member, but I'm telling you, I'm willing to explore whatever has to be done, working with the state, working with your department and Unity of Greater New Orleans, for someone such as this person who needs long-term psychiatric care, who finally agreed to go because of the NOPD and EMS and the health department giving her the attention that they needed, that she needed, she's in a better place now. I hope that we can come together and find a way that there can be more care available for longer terms than up to a month. Councilman Green, I'd be more than happy to um, to work with anybody on that. We're doing a lot of right work here. on the state and federal level, but it is a huge need. And it is a large amount of resources required, but it is something we have not had since Katrina. And it's something that you can see the results of that. So It's, it's got to yeah. change because it's costing lives. Yes. And as a society, we can do much better. Okay. I mean, we invest so much money in rehabilitating stadiums and so much money and things that don't relate so much directly to care for human beings. I am willing to work with you. And I know this, this council is willing to work with you, but Ms. Avegno, you got to tell us what we need to lobby for during this legislative session to get the ability to have more long-term psychiatric care, comprehensive psychiatric care in our city. That is really the solution to some of the concerns that we yes. have. I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Council member Darius, are you ready? I, I, I'm ready. Okay. Council member Thomas and I were just sidebarring here. Um, I, I guess I wanted to ask you about this. I, I, I read this weekend uh, a long form article by Ezra Klein, who was covering homelessness to see Dr. Avegno shaking her head, <laughs> but I, they spent a billion dollars and they're saying we haven't touched the problem. And so what I'm concerned about is I think we all agree on here what an answer is. You need better mental health services, you need better housing services, you need better wraparound services. We're all in agreement there. The question in my mind is, as we start putting money to it, how do we start showing, I think, what council members King and Green are talking about in terms of helping people, making sure that they move from transitory housing to long-term housing, making sure their addiction issues are being met. And, um, and I guess this is a sort of a two-parter. So how do we handle that? And I guess Dr. Abegno too, I know there might be HIPAA issues involved in some of that, but I, but, I, but I guess my concern just is we need to invest. I think we all agree that we need to invest, but investing, how do we show that this is working, this is maybe in a yellow zone and hasn't been as effective and this is a red, and it just yeah. it is it doesn't it doesn't either work in this neighborhood or here. So I'm just curious for your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll I'll start, Taylor, if you don't mind. So you talk about Los Angeles investing a billion dollars over however many Correct. years and has very little to show for it. So a billion dollars without a workable plan is just as bad as having a plan with no money. Right. 
And we have been sort of on the opposite side. The last plan we have is about 10 years old. Um, a few things happened in that plan, like the low barrier shelter, which have been net good things. Understand that, and, and maybe Unity will talk about this, our homeless population itself has not increased significantly over the last several years. It is different in characteristics, but the number of unsheltered people on the street and the larger number are roughly equivalent. However, the visibility, I think, has increased and the needs have increased and the threat of others being driven into it has increased. So you, we had a plan, but we didn't have any resources to back up the plan. What we need is money and a smart plan that is informed by the reality on the ground and not just the reality of, well, we need more housing, we need more of this. But I think I really wanna shout out the work of our team. I don't think there's anybody anywhere in America going to the folks that this affects and saying, We're, why don't you wanna live in a shelter? What kind of shelter is the right shelter? And what, what should we be investing our money? Because what LA did you know, to some degree was, we're going to build all these affordable housing developments, except they got mired in the things that that happened. So they have a couple of hundred units for 60,000 homeless people. They didn't invest in, well, could we buy a couple of hotels, turn those into single room occupancy? How many people could we get off the street with that? How many people could we get off with tiny houses? How many people would go into an expanded low barrier shelter? Um, so you really need a strategy that is efficient and appropriate resources not just throwing good money after bad. You want to? Uh, yeah, I would also, on top of that, want to acknowledge that shelter is only the first step. Yeah. Uh, people living in a shelter are still homeless. Uh, so it's that is step one to get people off of the streets. Then getting folks into long-term housing with all the wraparound services, that, that is a whole different step. Um, there are five communities in the United States that have uh, met the definition of ending chronic homelessness, which is not to say that they've ended homelessness, they've ended chronic homelessness, which is where you've been homeless for a year or more. Um, so it's, it's not that there is a, a, an easy solution to this, but it is possible. Um, and I think uh, New Orleans would benefit greatly from looking at those five models that have uh, ended chronic homelessness and seeing what they're doing well. Most often, it's that they sort of work on an individual at an individual level. You know, you talk to a hundred people who are living unsheltered, you're going to get a hundred reasons why they're out there. Uh, so you need to have a system that can address a hundred different needs. Um, and so it's it's not about um, it's about being flexible um, and, and having this sort of robust, comprehensive system that can address all of these very small needs instead of saying we're going to invest in housing. Period. That's that's not going to get us where we need to be. It, it's got to be much more flexible um, to to get to that sort of granular level. And I think you're going to hear Unity present on the grant application that was just submitted, that I think goes a long way towards um, having a really smart, sensible plan. No, well, look, I appreciate it, and and I guess where I am is almost in all these problems, there isn't a cookie cutter. I see a bag no shaking head. Yeah, it's not a cookie cutter or paint by numbers approach. You, there are obviously people who have fallen on hard times. That is one category. You have people who have addiction issues. You have people who have domestic violence. And so they can't stay with that. There's a host of things that happen. So then how do you provide the right services to everybody depending on what their individual services are? And I think that's where, that's where things both need to get done, but also are difficult because you'd love to apply bright line rules to people. And I think Tyler, you're right. It's individual situations. Mm -hmm. You have to have a hundred ad hoc decisions to get to the right point, but having a framework within that mm -hmm. to operate is important too. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council Member King. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to add that I did read that Ezra Klein article that Councilman Jerusalem mentioned, and Los Angeles put about 1.2 billion into the homeless issue, and it went from 28,000 unhoused people to 42,000 unhoused people. So clearly, just throwing money at the issue isn't the answer. Um, Councilman Thomas and Green also had had great points, and uh, it's it's a very sensitive subject, it's, and it puts often us, and especially myself, like smack dab in the middle 
of this issue because District C, I, I would argue, is, is mostly affected by um, this issue with the NSA that being kind of closed down on Poland. Mm -hmm. And once that closed down, or uh, once that was boarded up, we received a lot of calls and emails about different neighborhoods kind of being saturated or having more homeless, or unhoused people in them. Um, Treme under the Claiborne overpass, the French Quarter has seen a growth and, and Bywater has seen a growth. So my, my question really is, and it, it may have been answered, I, I don't know, is what, simple question, what, what is the, the answer to this, uh, to this issue? Is it, is it, is it, are there several answers? Are there are several answers, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I, I scratch my head a lot because I put, I get put in the middle, we have a meeting, you, I, I get told you're, you're being insensitive to people who are unhoused and um, it's not a crime and leave them alone. And then you get told, well, what about me? Is, is, is it a crime to, to walk outside and have to step over somebody who's sleeping in front of your lawn and they, they have waste on, on your sidewalk? And I'm kind of stuck in the middle. I may be speaking for myself, but it's a very difficult position to be in and I, I I'm, I'm looking for help and answers. We all are on how to address this because it's a difficult situation. Yeah. Uh, what I will say, I think uh, it, something that is important, I th I'm glad that you brought up um, the NSA facility that we have found pretty consistently that moving the problem isn't going to help. Um, we, we've had a number of public areas that have been shut down, um, fences put up, and like you mentioned, it just moves the problem. Um, you know, we had a, a ton of problems over at the Naval base, absolutely. But now we're seeing problems in residential areas. Um, and so uh, we have uh, we have a report that we're working on um, sort of summarizing the work that our department has done over the last year that includes a number of proposals uh, outside of the ordinance recommendations that we brought up today. Uh, and that's one of our recommendations is to, um, you know, if we're going to not shut down public spaces because that's just going to displace folks, that's just going to make them distrust us um, and, and not actually solve anything and just create new problems in new areas. Um, so we're, we're gonna have this report to y'all in the next couple of weeks um, that has some more um, specific proposals, but uh, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I think that's a really important point, which doesn't answer your question. <laughs> Um, that, that's not a solution, but something instead to uh, maybe not be looking at doing. Well, I think the answer is there are lots of answers. And if there's only five communities that have maybe figured it out, we need to be borrowing from every community that has a, that has made success in one area, whether that's affordable housing, whether it's wraparound services, whatever it is. And I'm really encouraged by the fact that both the administration and the council are investing in this, not only with a dedicated position to be sort of the central repository, but a consultant who can bring all of the best practices that we can then adapt here. And as long as we resource it appropriately, we've got a much better chance of getting farther down the road. So I saw that Houston, the last comment, Houston made some strides in reducing their homeless population. Yep. Is that a model to follow? <laughs> yeah. We, their their okay. person is coming here in okay. two weeks and will likely be a longer term partner. Sounds good, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, before I take public comment, I'd like to just uh, go through some questions that I have. Um, can you give me an estimate of our unhoused population? I believe, and uh, Unity will be able to give you the more specific number. I believe it was in the uh, High, uh, entirely or just unsheltered? Unsheltered. Uh, unsheltered was a, a just under 400. How does that compare with a city like Houston? Uh, it's much lower. And a city like Los Angeles? Im impossibly lower. <laughs> so four, 400 in the high 400s, is that correct? Uh, uh, Low 400. High 300s, like uh, 380 ballpark. Unity will be able to give you a more precise. So theoretically, we could touch every single unsheltered person. 300 people could fit right here. Maybe not. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Our, si our, our, ish our sort of scale of the problem has always, since, since the post-Katrina days when we had 10,000 unsheltered, 10,000 homeless people because of Katrina, the last several years, when you compare us to other cities of varying sizes, we're kind of in the middle. That doesn't mean that it is not a problem. That doesn't mean that we don't throw everything at it. 
But if you have been to California, if you have been to New York City, it is a very, we are a, a much more reachable and doable scale. I'm, I want to talk about scale because uh, to Taylor's point, I think having individualized solutions for people is really effective. We worked together uh, just last week with Unity on somebody who, three people who were unsheltered because they came down here for a job and all they wanted was a gas card to get back to where they came from. And we worked together to get them that gas card so that they could return home, right? So, I mean, I think this just goes to um, how individualized solutions and understanding individual problems can actually help um, rectify in some respects some of the folks who are on the street. That was just my comment. Um, I do want to turn to mental health issues. I know since charity shut down, um, there has been a lack of mental health services. What do we see on the horizon as far as LCMC, Tulane, other organizations providing additional mental health services for the unhoused? So we we have we are in a much better position than we were certainly in the first five to ten years post Katrina, where it wasn't just charity closing, it was charity plus the Jindal administration's slashing of the mental health budget. So most of our sort of longer term, to your point, Council Member Green, facilities all across the state closed. And the bar now for long-term psychiatric treatment is incredibly, incredibly high. Um, those of us who are practitioners and providers have been trying to sound the alarm about this for years. In terms of our acute crisis system, as you all know, we are building that capacity significantly with alternative dispatch. You know, we, we envision that alternative dispatch will be dispatched to folks who you see on the street, they might be acting a little off. You're not sure, are they homeless? Are they not? They're going to have to have a lot of skills and resources because a lot of the people they are going to interface may be homeless, right? So there's the ability to at least provide some acute services. Um, we, we have we are increasing our capacity to do addiction treatment, but it is nowhere near appropriate and our systems have not really talked to each other. Um, one of the things that Councilman Druso, I, I know wants to do with the mental health collaborative is get all of the players in the system together so that we can have a much more cohesive system that has lacked in mental health here for a very long time. We're not unique, other cities as well, but if the systems aren't talking to each other, that's how people fall through the cracks. We, we have you know, beds for short-term stabilization. We have outpatient clinics, but they're not really being um, utilized as a system. So that is something that I hope the Mental Health Collaborative will work on. We had a call with some of our federal delegation this week to talk about what federal opportunities are there, not only for long-term psychiatric care, because that came up, increase funding to encourage more people to take, take this on. Um, there's a lot that can be done. There's, and I, I think we're in a better place than we have been, but it, it, again, it's gonna take sustained effort, sustained building of a framework and resources in a way we have not done before. I wanna to turn to the low barrier shelter. Um, so you said that there are beds available, but the, there's a lack of staffing. Correct. What is the current rate of pay for the staffers there? Uh, our understanding is that it's about 1325 an hour. And what would you suggest would be appropriate for folks working in this space? They've got a hard job. Um, I don't, I mean, <laughs> uh, I would say 2025, 20, um, it's, it's a hard job uh, and an important one. And why is it hard? It's hard because they're there 24 hours a day. It's, it's addressing the 100 different needs of the people inside. Uh, the Low Barrier Shelter has a great model that provides a lot of wraparound services. Uh, so those staff members have to be very flexible, uh, very patient. Um, they, they are, they're doing really, really hard work. Um, for folks who don't want to go to the low barrier shelter, I know we've talked privately about some options. So, uh, for example, I think Council Member Thomas spoke about it uh, using Poydras Row or some sort of tract of land to put um, tiny homes or, uh, or movable tents so that there is a designated area. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think what we have heard a lot is that people want a sense of autonomy. Um, people, people have mentioned multiple times in our conversations of like having a place that is your own. Um, so having something that, that, 
that you can shut and lock the door um, is important to a lot of folks. I mean, that, that's important to, I think, everyone in this room uh, to be able to have a place that's just yours, um, that, that you can be, uh, have a, a sense of privacy uh, and security. So I, I think it's a, a model worth exploring. It's model a model that has been successful in a lot of other um, cities. We, um, you know, the successful housing placements from a shelter system uh, can be anywhere from like 10 to 20 percent. Uh, for tiny home models, we see that even the lowest performing um, tiny home models is about a 30 percent placement rate, and that can go up to 50. Um, so th those models can be successful. You need to do it well. Yeah. Uh, you need to have the wraparound services. Uh, you, you need to make it a place that people want to go to. Um, but it, it is something I, I think uh, that is worth pursuing. And wraparound services on site, meaning yeah. there. Correct. Correct. So it's not Unity having to go try to locate people right, right there. It's, it's right there. Yeah. And I'll say another model that we've talked about that is emerging as a best practice is um, taking over unused hotels and converting them either short term or long term and unity can speak to the success during COVID when we were able to use COVID funding to house um, almost all of our unsheltered in hotels. Again, it is a challenging environment and requires 24 seven wraparound services, but there is a much better success rate in getting people and keeping them in permanent housing. And again, that's a lot, you know, the cost of that is probably less than a lot of the other things that have been proposed. And we're talking about 400 people roughly. Right. Correct. That's two hotels, basically. Um, the final question that I have for you all before we get to public comments is the role of the state with cleanups, um, with enforcement efforts. What, are they helping? Can we get them to help more? Uh, we have a working relationship with DOTD. Um, generally, it is uh, most of the areas that we uh, end up cleaning along the Claiborne and Calio corridors are technically DOTD property, uh, but it is on the city, has been on the city historically to maintain those spaces. Um, we work closely with them when they have maintenance needs uh, and there are folks in those living areas. So, you know, if they have to, uh, there was an instance after uh, Hurricane Ida uh, at the corner of Calliope and O.C. Haley, uh, where they had to basically redo the entire um, traffic signal uh, infrastructure. So we uh, we worked with DOTD to go out ahead of time, let folks know that that entire intersection was gonna be off limits for a while. Uh, we got out in plenty of time, folks were able to move, they completed the construction, folks were able to come back. Um, that That's, I would say, an instance where we work really well with the state when they, when they need to come in and, and conduct maintenance. But otherwise, generally, uh, we don't, really engage with them in our general cleaning operations. And I always say final question, it's never a final question, but <laughs> you know, we talk about folks who are feeding, people who, who think that they're doing charity and maybe this is a question for unity. I said this the last time, people bringing food underneath the bridge to feed folks, um, rather than donating to organizations like Unity, Grace at the Green Light, places where people can actually go get fed in a sanitary way. What's your take on that? And is there anything that we can do to um, have people sort of avoid taking food that nobody's going to eat, frankly? Yeah. Uh, so I would say generally, we don't want to discourage people from charitable giving. Um, people got to eat. We understand that. Uh, but there is an issue when you bring, you know, these large trays of, of, yeah, from catering, we we had an we've had multiple instances where we have found uh, huge things of raw meat uh, that have been sent uh, set to spoil. Um, so it's it's about you know we want to encourage individual portions. Um, you know what folks can eat immediately because if it if you're not able to eat it right away, uh, it can go bad and uh, even worse uh, yeah. draw rodents. Um, we all you know if you're going to be donating food. Uh, being, going even further and bringing trash bags, appropriate receptacles, so that the folks living there can clean up after themselves because they do want to clean up after themselves. There just isn't the infrastructure in place along these places uh, uh, in these encampments to deal with that sort of level of waste. I'm going to go a step farther. I would say that it is a significant public health issue when groups, well-meaning or no, come down and dump food of any kind um, and then leave. You haven't really done anything for that individual and you've potentially caused an infectious disease problem that we have encountered several times. Um, we have wonderful organizations in the city that feed every day. 
We have the Rebuild Center, we have St. Jude's, there's many others. And our generally our unhoused population know where they are, where to find them. They feed people in a, the food is prepared in a sanitary measure. I don't know what your church group, how they cooked that food or didn't cook it, right? They also, when you go to a place like Rebuild, there are bathrooms available that you can use. So you are not making things worse. So I would urge anyone who has that inkling, there are so many better ways to give. You can give your money to Unity. You can give to Traveler's Aid. You can support Rebuild St. Jude's. All the, if they're not hard to find, you can support Ozanam Inn, who also does feeding. Most of the places do. And you will not only be helping someone, but you will be linking them better to services and you will not be causing them to get ill. And I don't think that anybody really wants that to happen, but it is a real possibility. I, I just wanna thank you for all of the work that you do. I know that we've worked closely together and probably saw probably once a week, I know you and Matthew talk more, um, but just thank you. Um, I'm gonna to go to public comment now. Um, the first person is Daniel Mark. And as a reminder, it's two minutes per person. Um, I'll, I'll be very quick. I think ultimately, you know, y'all use a lot of words and throw them around. And I think there's a true difference between catering to and compassion. If you look at any civilized nation with social structure programs in place, there's some strings attached to it. If I'm taking public money, I have to abide by the rules and doctrine of said public money and also from y'all's perspective, it would be in your best interest to determine the efficacy of the programs you're implementing to secure additional funding. So that's my general comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Kim Ford. Good afternoon, Ms. Ford. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I want to see Eugene Green removed from the uh, uh, task force committee for uh, the residents of Garden Plaza. He needs to get off of that committee. And I'm going to be calling to find out how this community can help a council person to get off that committee because you're disrespectful to those elders that live in that community and you're a hindrance to that community doing it, that committee doing its work. That's number one. Two, what I came up here to talk about today is that. I hear the health department talking about a specific demographic. I heard no conversation about the number of families that are now becoming homeless. I didn't hear, I hear that's like the individual homeless person, but I see children sleeping in cars that's homeless. So I, I didn't hear anything in your report about that. And that troubles me. But I also didn't hear the fact that you are doing outreach to those who are most affected, those who are involved with those most affected, make the best resources before we even begin some conversation on getting a consultant. Because I've had enough of this city spending the community's money on all of these consultants, and we keep doing the same thing, but we still get the same response, which is nothing. So we have to do things different. And until our leadership gets more inclusive and respectful to the people in this community, we'll all do better. And I want to ask him, do you live in Orleans Parish? Yes, ma'am. Okay, because somebody told me you lived in Mandeville. Uh, no, ma'am. Are you from Mandeville? No, ma'am. From New Orleans? Uh, not originally, no. Yeah. So when we have people, our council member Thomas was talking about how the people who are traditionally from this community know things about this community. New Orleans is not the same as Houston, Texas. New Orleans ain't the same as the rest of Louisiana. We do things differently here and we need to start acting like it and get better at what we're doing here. Thanks, Ms. Ford. Chris Lawson. Chris? I, I thought, okay, you don't have a card? Yeah. Uh, Chris Lawrence, I'm sorry, I said Lawson. I can't read your handwriting, sir. Hi, good afternoon, council members. My name is Chris Lawrence, president against the forces of all evil. My solution is this, the three problems in the city, crime, mental health illness, and um, homeless. 
I know every homeless person in the city, it's ridiculous. They don't have no motivation. They want to shoot heroin, smoke crack, behind charity hospital, homeless shelter. If you go there, they're doing drugs all night long. They got security. The security let them do it. Right there in Duncan Plaza, right now, all day and night, they shoot heroin, they smoke crack. Benny Nungas is going to be the next governor. I'm going to tell y'all something. The state will manage the French quarters. We're going to go to court behind it. State police, Department of Corrections, going to be added to the 8th district. They got a perimeter in the city. Claiborne to the river, by water to Earhart. You can't carry no guns. If you had a daughter graduated from Harvard Sunday morning, you take her to breakfast. Y'all walk out the club on Royal Street. She trips on a homeless man sleeping. That vomit, that's not acceptable. So I want the homeless people, by law, a city audience, you cannot sleep in the French quarters, in the perimeter, McDonald's, Canal Street, no sleeping at all. Arrest the homeless person if they're in violation. Put them in jail. You got to fight. You got to have tough love. You can't help nobody that don't want to help themselves. So a city audience will solve this matter. Yeah, we need shelters. We need jobs. We need rehab. But if a homeless person don't want to help themselves, every governor in the state, every governor in the United States, responsibility is homeless. Every governor responsibility for a criminal is the custodian under the United States Constitution. It's up to the governors of each state to solve this problem. It don't lie in the city council hand. It lies in each governor of each state in the United States under the Constitution. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, Maxwell. Thank you, Council Members Maxwell, Chardula, Louisiana Fair Housing Action Center. Um, so uh, like Council Member Thomas, I'm not interested in pitting folks against each other. Um, this is an all hands on deck situation. Um, and there are a lot of ways that you all have actually helped and I wanna give you credit for that. So the right to counsel ordinance is already decreasing evictions and that is one of the main drivers of homelessness. So thank you for that. Um, I know that uh, the healthy homes ordinance, which you all support, um, is also another way that we start to get at decreasing retaliatory evictions. So that's another opportunity to tackle this. So thank you for your support for that. Um, I think what I'm mostly here to say is that the long-term solution here does involve resources, right? And so, you know, I think we have uh, some of the smartest people in the city working on this and, and Dr. Avegno and Taylor, and we have a really, a well-experienced and smart uh, continuum of care and unity. I'm really excited that y'all are spending time and energy on this. I think we've got the right people together to put the plan together. I, what I'm urging you is that this is a rare moment where the city has a budget surplus and ARPA money. And so I would just urge you that in this incredibly rare moment to please dedicate, dedicate some of that to this to the to the resources we need to solve this problem, um, I think that's a that's a that investment would be a win for unhoused people, for neighborhoods, for businesses. It's it helps everyone. And the last thing I'll say is that um, we are making this one of our top priorities when we talk to the legislators at the state and the governor as well. Um, there is surplus there as well. We made this a huge priority last session, and we're going to do it again this session because we wanna make sure we're bringing as much money back here from all possible opportunities. Uh, ma 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 Madam Chair, you, yeah, no, I, just, I wanna thank uh, uh, Maxwell and the advocates. Uh, we're blessed to have people like you and some of the best experts, uh, I think in this country working on this. I think what you see in many cases from our side is uh, frustration and the lack of expertise. But I, I do agree with you that what, what our chairwoman is doing is, and what I think this council and the community is doing is, is offering an opportunity to do something sustainable here. So that moment of time is here, but I didn't want this to go by without saying that, uh, you know, thank you and 
any of the folk you work with for the work that you do. But I think the frustration level, because to not have the answers, but to have the experts and to have some resources, we are at that moment in time in history now. Thank you. Are you all in a position to assist with the Housing Authority of New Orleans and the new vouchers that are coming out in terms of reaching out to those who are unhoused? Could you work with organizations to help identify ways for them to apply? Oh yeah, we are we are uh, sharing that resource and making sure that as many people as possible see that. That's okay. definitely something we're already on top of. I believe, okay, and maybe it's a right. Councilman Thomas has brought up maybe it's a unity issue. I think it's an all hands on deck issue. It's an opportunity mm -hmm. that hasn't existed for a while. The roles are going to be open. Right. Those are vouchers that are based on income levels. And we would have to find the housing, but at the end of the day, I think that a priority could be set to address the situation involving those who are unhoused. Absolutely, I should. We should just be clear, though, that those aren't there aren't new vouchers or more vouchers available. We're just reopening the wait list, which is something the housing authority does every so often because it gets stale, and sometimes people who are on there don't live here anymore or don't need a voucher anymore. So we don't, it's not actually an influx of new resources. It's still really important to make sure that people know that that opportunity is there and we're gonna help spread the word about it's it. It's not necessarily resources, but it's unused resources that can be made available to people. No, no that's what I'm it's saying a, is that they're not unused, that the, the all the vouchers that are in circulation now are, are awarded to a person. Um, the, what, the what, what, are, what are they opening up them between November the 1st and 6th? It's the wait list. So it's it's to put your name to get to wait to get your name called if someone you know does, stops using a voucher then they'll pull someone from the wait list to use that existing voucher. Okay, let's see if we can get the wait list these people on the wait list and then we use the influence that we all have to maybe get people moved up on the wait list based on the unhoused population. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Maxwell. I you know I want to say thank you um, for all the work you do as you're speaking to the state and as we need to speak to the state. I, my concern is that with the insurance rates going up, that we're going to see a lot more people who are losing homes or who are out on the street and unsheltered. Right. And so I think we need to use whatever power of advocacy that we have to talk about insurance rates um, for existing houses and for people who have existing homes and might lose their homes because uh, rates are going up, you know, $5,000 and how can anybody afford that? So thank yeah, you for your work. I, I agree completely. And, and we have someone on staff who does foreclosure prevention counseling. So if you have constituents where that becomes a concern and they contact you, please do send them our way. I do. I have a list from Habitat. So we'll get that with for yeah. you. Um, I have one more comment from Casey Davis. This is bullshit. Let me tell y'all something. I'm Jesus Christ. Helena Moreno going to be the next man. Call the fucking police all y'all want. Y'all disrespecting me. I know what to do about holding. Oh, I'm, what I'm saying don't make no sense. Ben and I'm going to take over the quarters. Helena Moreno going to be the next man. I'm going to show you. I run the city. Bitch ass, shit with that. Man, what is wrong? I'm a city employee, Miss Miss Davis, and our building was shut down recently, which led me to walk into Duncan Plaza. There was a child with his parents who were homeless, and there was a couple with a dog who was homeless, who I interviewed just because I had the time. I found out there's no place for a couple with a dog to share a shelter together in this city. I'm aware when people come together to create a solution in numbers that it really does make a difference because I have felt significant change as an individual on the streets. I have engaged with the homeless for the last couple months alone on Claiborne and in Duncan Plaza. I've walked Calliope. I've seen Chapatulis. I've watched the barriers go up over the years, pushing individuals out of public spaces. And they are encroaching on the neighborhoods and in the empty homes. Um, I have family members who are also struggling to pay taxes who will wind up homeless uh, as we have energy rates, taxes, everything goes up. We can all be in the same boat. 
it's time now that we set a date to walk the streets and get people off immediately. Behavioral health is number one because these people feel unwanted and they definitely want to work. They want a purpose. And I think the system that's in place is confusing. There's little communication. They don't know where to go. And by the time they get there, they get turned away without meeting their needs. I sat with somebody yesterday to get a Medicaid card, didn't happen yet. I went to the social security office to help somebody get a social security card. I almost got kicked out of there. I went into the VA shelter to see what I can do to help. Almost got kicked out of there just for asking for an email address. This has been difficult for me to figure out how I can help, let alone how those individuals feel like they can help themselves when they wound up in that place in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Um, thank you all for appearing here today. Thank Clark. you very much. Appreciate it greatly. Thank you. Thank you. We have a Three online comments. Let's go ahead and take those. And before we do that, because we have quorum, let's go ahead and I'm going to move to approve the minutes. Second. Second in by Council Member Green. All in favor? Everyone's in favor. All right. <laughs> First uh, comment is from Jonathan Hill with the Bakery Condominiums HOA Board it says, um, please discuss the disparity in the rights in the New Orleans homeless community as compared to the law abiding tax paying property owners in the warehouse district. There's an open air, there is open air prostitution on Calliope and Chapatulas. Is that a health issue? There is open air drug dealing and use of illegal drugs in Calliope and Chapatulas. Is that a health issue? <clears throat> There is public urination and defecation on Calliope Chapatulas. Is that a health issue? I know stealing bikes is not a health issue, but the homeless community on Calliope Chapatulas sure steal a lot of bikes from the warehouse district too. 70130 is the highest priced real estate in Louisiana, and we have to deal with rampant prostitution, drug use, stealing bicycles, public urination, defecation from the homeless community on Calliope Chapatulas. 70130 is home to the convention center. All convention visitors, including 15,000 anesthesiologists in town this week, see the trash, homeless camps, street prostitutes, and the other criminal behavior in the Calliope Chapatulas homeless camps. Please help us in the warehouse district. Thank you. Next comment is from Sage Michael Pellet. He says, what does homelessness look like now? you or I can face this situation any given day. Thank you for the taking time to discuss this important topic. Topic: People are not homeless, they are houseless. We cannot use the phrases which disconnect the compassion from the people we intend to serve. Instead of clean up, say revitalize, beautify. The word encampment is better phrased as dwelling. The market controls the price for housing and the taxes in which they generate. Sometimes houselessness is a choice or a transition. There's nothing wrong with living outdoors. Outdoors, It's how God created us. God provides everything we need from the land if we connect to it and cultivate. The Culture of Cleanliness campaign meets community members where they are and provide and where they are and build relationships by treating them with dignity and offering supportive services as stipends for participation in events. I'm thankful for the organizations presenting today. What areas of the city does your outreach cover. I often see a lot of resources in a concentrated area near the CBD French Quarter tourist destinations. Seemingly these initiatives are used to improve tourist areas while the rest of the city is neglected. How much outreach and engagement is done in each council district? And the last comment for this item number is from Casey Davis, representing homeless communities. Temporary and permanent restrooms and shower facilities plus access to potable water would provide environmental health and justice for the thousands of individuals living with limited access to clean water and sewage. The city needs 
public restroom facilities to be accessible and convenient, not just for the homeless, but for all travelers and visitors alike who may need a sanitary, healthy, and proper space available at any given time or location, who may account to provide and maintain permanent public restroom shower and potable water faucet facilities to many public spaces that will function to improve the health and cleanliness of individuals who may not otherwise have access to such basic necessities. Um, I see I have another card from Jonathan Hill. Jonathan, do you want to come up? You got two minutes. And did you have a written comment as well? Was that you? I, submit, I submitted two comments via the internet prior okay. to this meeting. Okay. And so there's another one that I don't think was read. But regardless, my name is Jonathan Hill. As you can see, I'm here today representing the Bakery Condos, which is located at 1111 South Peters in the Warehouse District. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the city council today. I appreciate uh, Councilwoman Harris. I communicate quite often with her office and her office is quick to respond to me. I guess I'm a little bit more particular about our situation in the warehouse district and the crime and homelessness that it exists along the Cali Oak and the, and the Chapatuas area. That is right on our block. And they've, they've started coming across Cali Oak now and they're on private property. We do have open drug use. When I say illegal drug use, I don't mean cannabis. I mean methamphetamine. I mean crack cocaine. I mean heroin. There are needles laying around. This is going on in the warehouse district. Um, there's also solicitation of prostitution, car dates at the corner. Um, this is a reality that we live in. And also people just urinating publicly in the warehouse district and defecating in our doorsteps and on our, our, our entryways. We really need help. And I listened to the, the uh, health department and there was a, a great concern over the homeless and I, I am sympathetic to the homeless people. There also needs to be concern as, as uh, Councilman Thomas said, for the residents and the business owners, it's got to be a balance. But right now, everything is, is focused toward the, the homeless people and those living in the area are just having to deal with it. Um, one other comment I wanted to make was why is panhandling a, a uh, is it illegal or against the city ordinance? If it is, why don't we have signs on the corners that say panhandling in, in New Orleans is illegal. Please do not feed or give money. There are services available to help. Why can't we put those on every corner? We started putting some some of them up in district we're, in we're district E. These people, yeah, we're... money, prostitution. They get money and then they just. So, thank you very much. I want to be positive. I love this city. I appreciate this city council. I appreciate Councilwoman uh, Harris. I appreciate Mr. Schoenberger. Thank you. Please help us with this situation. The, the convention goers. 15,000 anesthesiologists came in today and saw, or this week and saw nothing but trash and homelessness. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next agenda item. Next item is um, Unity of Greater New Orleans Homeless Initiatives and Outreach, outreach Updates. Great. The presenters are Angela Patterson, Deputy Director of Unity of Greater New Orleans, Martha Kegel, Executive Director of Unity of Greater New Orleans. It's always uh, great to see you all and hear from you about the services that you provide. And what I especially want to hear you talk about are the needs that you have, especially from our business community, um, as they need to step up their game if they're gonna complain about homelessness. So looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Angela Patterson, uh, Unity's Deputy Director, is going to lead off our presentation. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is such a pleasure to be here. I'm Angela Patterson. I head the direct services programs of Unity. And in that, it includes the outreach team at Unity. Before I begin my presentation, I want to thank the chairperson, Councilwoman Harris, and the rest of this Quality of Life Committee because it is really through your efforts that there is beginning to be such a tremendous compassion, interest, focus on the whole of our community. 
including those who are unsheltered, as I say. We have a terrific outreach team at Unity. They really, really sacrifice labor, risk their lives in some circumstances, providing services and housing navigation to those experiencing being unsheltered in our community. But I really appreciate the individual referrals that I frequently receive from your offices and those opportunities to make direct contact from outreach to particular individuals who are unsheltered. So thank you for that. I'm going to tell you a little bit of information about Unity first of all. Unity is the homeless continuum of care. It's a collaborative of 50 plus agencies who together coordinate Unity of Greater New Orleans. The mission of Unity is to prevent reduce and end homelessness in our New Orleans and in Jefferson Parish and the city of Kenner. Unity was founded in 1992 and it has through its agencies permanently housed over 56,000 vulnerable people thereby ending or preventing their homelessness. Unity is designated by the city of New Orleans, the city of Kenner, Jefferson Parish, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development as the lead agency for the homeless continuum of care for our community. And it's designated to apply for competitive HUD COC funds. Unity grants pay for various programs, including permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing, transitional housing, coordinated entry, homeless management information system, and planning. The vast majority of grants, and this is really frequently misunderstood because lots of people say Unity gets millions, but the vast majority of this funding goes to pay for rent assistance and case management services for 3,531 people who have already been rescued out of homelessness and are living in housed, successfully housed situations in our community and have been for months and years. We have such an outstanding Unity Outreach team. I'm going to name them. They are Clarence White III, who is the Outreach Manager Clarence will be very happy to hear this. Jocelyn Scott, the assistant manager. We also have Jeremy Finnegan and Laurie Arsenault. They're heroes in our community. In 2010, the outreach team's record of rescuing and rehousing thousands of people from street encampments and abandoned buildings earned them a recognition by the National Alliance to End Homelessness for its nonprofit award. In 2020, the Unity Outreach Team, along with other best practices in New Orleans, which included the low barrier shelter, was recognized in a national study of best practices in reducing street homelessness by Arnold Ventures, a natural philanthropy, a philanthropy organization. In 2022, the Unity Outreach Team's work in concert with local and state government was able to assist over 1,000 people who were taken off the streets, as we've heard before, with the health department and others who were placed in hotels initially, and all of them agreed to move off the street into this hotel setting, which is really significant in terms of motivation. And this practice was recognized by Governor John Bell Edwards and the Louisiana Housing Corporation with a prize, and we were all in Baton Rouge to receive it, of the Jean Butler Housing Heroes Award. So these four outreach workers will be involved and Councilman Green, you mentioned earlier how important this opening of the Housing Authority vouchers will be to assist our unsheltered, unhoused community. We're going to have a blitz. 
which means a collaborative effort of outreach teams. And we're planning this in order to assist unsheltered people on the streets with doing these applications and submitting them to the housing authority to ensure that they will be properly done and rapidly submitted so that they will be amongst the first persons in our community to apply. So we are trying all best practices approaches that we can be aware of. We strategize, we meet, we collaborate. We're trying our best. We're trying our best to stop human suffering with unhoused per persons on the street and families on the street. And we are working collaborative with all of you and in particular with this committee to do that and house these unsheltered persons. So, Valerie. Thanks, Angela. I'm gonna go through some uh, data to go through both um, first on the national level, the trends that have been happening, um, which from 2007 through 2020, and this is from the annual point in time data, which even though we call it annual, it's only once a year. So it's one moment in time, the number of people who are experiencing homelessness that meant one night whether it's unsheltered or sheltered. So there has been an increase nationally from 2016 to 2020. And from our national data, 30% increase on unsheltered homelessness. Um, and there's a reason why, like most of the increase um, is from individuals, um, not as much from families with children or unaccompanied youth. Um, locally, as we all know, there's a huge decrease since 2007. Um, and this is our data from the point in time in January. So from 2019 to 2020 is when we started to see a little bit of an increase. And through a lot of the initiatives that we talked about with the uh, hotels and non-congregate shelter, 2021 was a decrease. And then we saw an increase again um, in 2022. Um, and this is where some of the key data is around, of breaking it down on who is experiencing unsheltered homelessness. So in January of this year, there were 364 people, which actually was a decrease of 34%. Um, so even though we don't wanna see anyone who is unsheltered, but we do have some positive things going on. Um, and even from the point in time count that was 364. There's a slight increase when we did the count again in June to 380. And most of the people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness are in New Orleans. Uh, our area includes Jefferson Parish as well. Um, majority are African American. And again, this is from the point in time data. Um, majority are not Hispanic or Latino. 78% male. We do think that the uh, gender non-conforming rate is uh, low. Um, our data may not be as inclusive as we would like it to be. Um, and by age, for the most part, people over age 24. And this slide is really from um, the hotel initiative. So we had several initiatives uh, in collaboration with the city and the state to provide non-congregate shelter directly from street outreach, place people into the hotels. And out of those folks that were assisted in the hotels, 91% had a disabling condition. 75%, the disabling condition was a serious mental illness and 69% a substance use disorder. And Martha is gonna go through uh, more of the special initiative and plans. Okay, well, I first want to thank the council for your um, concern and interest in this issue. And I think, you know, the good news is that we know what uh, works to decrease homelessness. And really, um, we recognize and we all recognize that homelessness is both a humanitarian crisis, but it's also a problem for the business environment for the city. And it's also affects the quality of life of just about every New Orleanian. So it's a problem that we need to work on for all kinds of reasons. Um, it's only gonna get worse if we don't invest in the solutions. Um, and 
I think it's really important to look at that, those charts closely because one of the striking things is that the perception right now that homelessness is way up on the street is actually not true. And that's one thing that needs to be understood. Um, homelessness on the street is actually down 34% from what it was pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, there were 550 people on the street in our point in time count. Those were actually counted people. And last February, when we did the point in time count, uh, that number was down to 364. We estimate that probably now, both parishes together, the number is more like 400. Um, we, we did a mini point in time in June that found that it was 380. And I think by now it's probably up to about 400. So of those probably at least 350 are New Orleans, the rest would be Jefferson Parish. But that number is down significantly from what it was pre-pandemic. How did we bring it down? We brought it down because we got resources during the pandemic that we all really fought for. We're still waiting on reimbursement from FEMA, by the way. <laughs> and Unity is, is, is shouldering a lot of that with our line of credit that we will never get reimbursed uh, you know, for the interest on. Um, and the state is also waiting on reimbursement. Um, but what's important to know is that when we get the resources, we can really bring the numbers down. In fact, by June of 2020, the numbers on the street were down to 30 people. And I think that's part of the perception issue is that people saw that there was no one on the street practically, and then they've seen the numbers go back up again. And so there's this perception that it's worse than it was before. It actually isn't. But if you understand what's driving homelessness, and I think a lot of you do, um, you also are concerned rightfully because the problem's going to get worse if we don't invest in the solutions. And, and what oftentimes uh, the ordinary person doesn't understand is that the major driver of homelessness and what study after study has shown is the far and away the major factor driving rates of homelessness is the shortage of affordable rental housing. A city has a high rate of homelessness per capita compared to another city, not because the city has a higher rate of mental illness, not because the city has a higher rate of substance addiction, but because a city has a higher, has a greater shortage of affordable rental housing. Until we solve our affordable rental housing shortage, we're gonna see the numbers continue to climb the only way around that is really about targeting specific rental assistance and case management to the, the, the homeless population in particular. So if there's any message I wanna leave you with, it's that one in particular that everyone needs to recognize is that while mental illness and substance use services are needed, definitely the major thing that's needed, the major investment is affordable rental housing. Um, and without that, we're gonna have problems. And like, I wanna uh, echo what Maxwell said uh, from the Fair Housing Action Center, that this is an opportunity right now with the deficit and with the ARPA funds to invest heavily in affordable rental housing. With that, without that, you're gonna see uh, the homeless numbers go up. And to uh, Councilman Jerusso's point, you know, if we let things get as bad as they are in LA, it, it will be almost impossible to dig our way out because there, the cost of, of land there, the cost of construction there is so out of sight that they can't begin to create enough affordable housing. They also have other structural problems. They have a weak mayor form of government, totally decentralized, and there's no one really rallying the troops to get every neighborhood to understand that we all need to be part of the solution. So I just wanna talk briefly about this um, special HUD grant that Unity just applied for on behalf of the community, on behalf of New Orleans and Jefferson Parish. Um, it is a wonderful opportunity to really make a dent in this problem. 
But I do need to emphasize that while I think we have a decent shot at getting it, it's extremely competitive. And off the bat, we lost a lot of potential points because we don't have enough people on the street. Actually, HUD gave a lot of, a lot of extra bonus points to communities that had over 1,000 people on the street. They gave even more to communities that had over 10,000, even more to communities that had over 30,000. Um, so, you know, we have to understand that while we have a decent shot at this, we all need to pray. Um, and, th and that we have, we have really no right to expect that this money is going to come down. We hope that we will score high enough that it will, but we shouldn't plan on it because, you know, the, it, it's very fierce competition. But it's enough resources to house 400 people plus, which is roughly the number of people in Orleans and Jefferson Parish. And so what we also were well aware of when working on this is that the process that HUD required us to do to even apply is something that will really help our community even if we don't get the grant. Um, and so I, I just wanna give a shout out to all who served on the community task force. Councilwoman Harris, thank you. Councilman King and Councilman Jeruso served along with uh, some council members from Jefferson Parish and some of our Dr. Vegno, Tyra Johnson Brown, business leaders, healthcare leaders, philanthropy leaders, homeless service providers, people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Uh, together, they did an amazing job raising uh, nearly $14 million and leveraging, uh, really exceeding the requirements of the grant, which should serve us well in the scoring. They developed a community plan to reduce street homelessness. And there was a council of people with lived experience that was uh, brought together that will be a lasting component of our work, it provided major input and signed off on the plan as HUD required. Um, if funded, the grant would provide permanent housing for at least 400 people each year including permanent supportive housing, which is the gold standard for how you end the homelessness of a person with disabilities who's homeless. Um, rapid rehousing, which is short-term rent assistance and case management, also a successful intervention. Uh, we use the opportunity to get some non-congregate shelter for at least 50 people a year. Um, expanded outreach. Uh, we have way too few outreach workers in our city for the number of people on the street and a pilot program at Ozanam Inn to improve access to shelter. Um, the key elements of the community plan, um, first and foremost, ensuring that people with lived experience of homelessness are consulted in the development of all strategies to address and reduce street homelessness. Why is this important? Well, it's important because it's the right thing to do morally to consult the people who are most affected, but it's also about being effective because if we build shelters and we don't first consult people living on the street about whether they'd be willing to go into them, it won't be successful. So absolutely that needs to be first and foremost. Ensuring equity in the work is very important because <clears throat> there are racial disparities. Uh, black people are much more likely to experience homelessness uh, than other races. Also, it's important to prioritize women and members of the LGBTQ plus community and others who are at higher risk of violence from living on the street. Mm -hmm. Very importantly, number three, increase the percentage of people on the street who access shelter and the percentage of people in shelter who came from the street. <clears throat> Dr. Vegno's team is doing an excellent job of really digging into some of this. The Council of People with Lived Experience and four different focus groups uh, that Ms. Angela chaired, people on the street gave us even more insight. And of course, we have many years of experience um, knowing about this. But in addition to um, really fully funding the, all the beds in the low barrier shelter, which is a first and foremost thing to do, um, it's vital 
that all the shelters, including the low barrier shelter, prioritize people living on the street rather than simply filling beds on a first come first need basis, which sounds fair, but that system disadvantages people with the greatest need for shelter. People with mental incapacity or physical disabilities are gonna be the least able to get first in line. Mm -hmm. And those are the people on the street who you need to um, make sure are using those beds if you really want to address the street homeless problem and keep it low. Related to that, we need to free up beds in all the shelters for those living on the street. And one of the key ways to do that, in addition to asking the shelters to set aside beds for people on the street, is to reduce the number of people who are entering shelter for the first time who didn't come from homelessness. Um, right now, something like um, only 40% of the people who are in any of our shelters are coming from the street. And some national data shows that probably one out of every two people who are going into shelter could have been helped without their housing crisis, whatever it was, could have been resolved without them coming into shelter. That is a really important data piece to be aware of. Um, there is an emerging best practice called problem solving, housing problem solving, that is a good way to help people who have a housing crisis without them taking up a bed that could be used by somebody on the street who needs it more. Um, and housing problem solving basically used uses well-trained workers who are trained in mediation, trained to help people come up with plans using their own skills and their own resources that they have access to with family, friends, to figure out another way to resolve their homelessness without going into shelter. It also very importantly needs to have attached to it a fund that is flexible because oftentimes people just need a little bit of money to help them over a crisis, and then they don't have to use up a shelter bed. And I wanna give a shout out to the Rosemary Foundation, which has provided some seed money for that flexible fund um, to help us with that. Um, and we need to encourage traditional shelters to lower barriers, and particularly um, the barriers that say that people have to leave out early in the morning and not come home until late. Very hard for a person living on the street to deal with that. Um, we need to eliminate the short lengths of limits on length of stay that also are a barrier to people with the highest needs who need the shelter. And we need to eliminate shelter fees. Those are all key to keeping this problem as, you know, to really decreasing the number of people who are having to live unhoused on the street. Expanding street outreach is important. Shout out to the DDD and the French Quarter Development District for their help with that. Um, we need to expand permanent housing. And again, permanent housing, permanent housing, permanent housing is the ultimate solution here. We can't build a big enough shelter. Mm. We can't build a big enough you know, encampment of tiny homes or whatever, whatever other solutions people are proposing to meet the number of people who are gonna fall into homelessness if we don't invest in the permanent housing solutions. Um, and so one thing I need to bring up here is that just to keep homelessness, the inflow of people who every week are showing up on the street who weren't there last week because they lost their housing. They were housed last week, now they're not housed. There's a tremendous inflow if we don't immediately invest, we won't be able to, we'll, we'll see homelessness climb probably to 600 people on the street in a year or so. So I would ask the administration and the council <clears throat> to work together to make sure that there is some rapid rehousing, rent assistance and case management set aside in the upcoming budget and that it's part of the allocation of ARPA just to make sure that we can keep up with the influx and decrease it uh, because we can't count on that federal grant coming in. Even if that federal grant comes, there's still influx, you know? So let's 
Let's do that investment. We've shown that we can make that work. We can be very effective with it. And we're willing to waive, if, if you want us to manage it, we're willing to waive any administration on that. We would do that for free. It's the money. The money needs to go to the homeless people. Um, and the case management services would be provided by our member agencies. And, and of course, the affordable rental housing investment, $50 million is what um, the Fair Housing Action Center has asked for as the ARPA allotment, and we agree with that. We need to invest in our people. People are struggling. You know, our most, the people who build this city, the workforce, doesn't have access to affordable rental housing. And at our end, it affects the most vulnerable. So um, thank you so much for having us today. We really appreciate your attention. Thank you, uh, Council Member Green. Yes, I mean, obviously there would be a number of questions. I didn't see this presentation, but I'll look at it because I want to study the numbers. I guess there's always going to be a discussion of where do you get to with the resources that you provide in terms of permanent. You can't use ARPA money as one-time money. I mean, you could, but for I'm rental, not looking for, for rapid rehousing. You could, yeah, for rapid rehousing. But at the end of the day, ten years from now, if you haven't addressed it, you're still going to have that concern. And you could build housing with it. You could Very build much. housing. You could, right. and that's I'm into absolutely the building critical. housing of it. I mean, the rental assistance is something that I see as a long-term goal. But I, I, I do want to say this: there seems to be a little bit of disconnect between encouraging the shelters to do various, take various practices. Do you feel that people are not interested in staying in a shelter because of some of the things that you mentioned? We know that our council on lived experience gave us a lot of insight to it, but our outreach team has been working with this population for years. So we were well aware of most of it. And I think that the, what the uh, health department survey is showing is even more detail, um, but even by their, you know, their, um, their surveys, there's, there's a lot of people who are willing to go into shelter, but they can't access it. So that's a, that's a problem right off the bat. But then in addition to that, what do you mean by that financially? <clears throat> um, you know, oh, over oh. and over again, people say that they've gone to the low barrier shelter. They can't get in. They've called the low barrier shelter. They can't get in. Um, and so, and, and we know from the data, because we keep the data through the homeless management information system, that the majority of people in the low barrier shelter did not come from the street. And yet we know that there's about 100 people on the street who would like to go in there. So we need to fix that problem. And we need to fix it by prioritizing, you know, saying that these beds are for the people on the street, or at least most of them. Maybe we want to say some of them are can be for other people, but I think... I think we need to be very focused and very disciplined in saying we want to decrease street homelessness because it's so dangerous. And it's also a problem for the community in other ways, but it's dangerous for the people experiencing it. So let's prioritize these beds for the people on the street. I've had questions, I've had conversations with entities such as Odyssey House. And I don't know what the barrier is to someone going to odyssey house and just saying that they want to stay in the shelter they say that they have available bids we see a statistic here that says we have 300 and some available bids i mean those bids don't all charge for their admission i mean yes they are they have to have some restrictions you can't leave at 2 a.m and come back at four for example but i mean I, I'm, I'm missing the lack of connection or communication after all these years between the shelters and what you're suggesting in terms of making them more accessible to people. What should the shelters do? Make your, take your suggestions. Is there a limit on the amount of suggestion that they can undertake? For example, I don't think that you can just have, maybe you can just in and out wherever, whenever you want. I mean, is that one of the concerns? Well, like a Red Cross shelter does that, a Red Cross shelter. You can, so you can leave at 2 a.m. and come back but, at 4? But I think the major problem with a lot of the shelters is that they don't have enough money to, well, they, that's to not, staff during the day. That's not what they say. Well, that is one of the things that we've been told. So I think that's one of the issues. But I think that um, we have in the past at different times with special projects gotten some of the shelters to set aside some beds for people on the street. And I think that needs to be an ongoing 
um, practice. And, you know, we are going to learn a lot. I think uh, working with the Asana men, which I, I think we plan to do regardless of whether we get the grant to try to see how we can, you know, just increase the percentage of their beds that are being used by people on the street. I think that that's something that the council should definitely get involved in across all of the shelters um, because it's key to decreasing the unsheltered population. Um, if people are at least in shelter, that's better than being unsheltered. The ultimate solution is permanent housing. We got to invest in that too, because you want people to feel like they're going to get permanent housing at the end of the day, whether they go into shelter or, or out on the street. You, you, need, you need the shelter to decrease your number of people experiencing the tragedy of homelessness. But the unsheltered problem is a particular problem. And part of it is using the beds we have as effectively as we can. I mean, the unsheltered population is so important because even if we look at the numbers we just discussed, we have 400 unsheltered people, but the number is like 40 who have died on the street. That's one out of 10 people who are unsheltered who are dying. So I, I recognize that, but I don't have the answer. And I'm, I'm going to study this and I'm going to study it all around. But when I look at this statistic that is on my left says, are you interested in staying in a shelter? And it's 66% no. But then I recognize that a lot of people die, like we're saying, one out of 10 people who are unhoused are dying on the streets. It's an emergency that we have to do something about. And I'm going to study it greatly because I know that we can't just focus on one side. I will strongly reject anyone who suggests that we aren't going to be sensitive because we're going to be very sensitive. But when you see one out of 10 people who are homeless dying, that's still an amazing statistic to me. I hope that it's a little wrong, but I mean that we, I mean, but yeah, that, that statistic that, might not be, I, I asked, yeah. I asked how many people might die each year on the street from who are unhoused. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I need so, some clarity. We're, when we're talking about homeless, so the total number of homeless, as Martha and team just pointed out, is about 1,200. Okay. Okay. When when we're trying- I was, ask, I was asking on the street. Yes. So, okay. But when we're, so on the street, it's about 360 to 400 in that range, right? When we're talking about getting a number of homeless deaths, as I was saying, it's very, very tricky to figure that out. In the, and what that might include is not only people on the street, but also people in shelters people who are in that 1200 homeless, but not necessarily on the street. We don't really know how many people who are homeless died on the street versus died in a homeless shelter versus some other, technically they are counted as homeless. Um, it is a high number, I don't wanna take that away, but I don't think we can say 10% of everybody on the street dies because that is that would not be accurate right so just to right. it's important and, and as soon as we when you know what if we can get a report from the coroner as we've asked for that's going to go a long way to helping us figure out that real number right and i want to see that report too um because that's my question was kind of specific to the unhoused who are on yeah. the streets because i'm a, i'm aware of some overdoses and of course a couple yeah we don't really know shot. we don't know I certainly yeah. hope that we get to the point where we find out. Council Member King. <clears throat> how, how many, um, the number of that you showed the street homelessness about parish, is that the 1200 number or, or is that the uh, 400 number? Uh, there's about 1200 total people in uh, actual homelessness, meaning they're either on the street or they're in temporary shelter for the homeless, for the unhoused. So of the 1,200, uh, about 364, exactly that many were homeless as of February 2022. And we estimate that now it's probably 400 and that's both parishes. So the New Orleans number is probably about 350 on the street. Okay. So the street homeless by race, that's 51% Black African-American, and that's 51% of 1,200? No, that's, the, that's just the unsheltered. So okay. HUD divides homelessness into sheltered homelessness, meaning that you're in a temporary shelter, 
or unsheltered homelessness, meaning you're living on the street in a car in an abandoned building. Um, and so the 364 number, which I now say is about 400 because the 364 number was back in February, is the unsheltered number living on the street in cars in abandoned buildings, whereas uh, the 1200 is the total number, including the people in shelters. That okay. makes sense. It, so, so the the racial data that you see is specifically for that um, unsheltered population living on the four hundred. All right. So I just want to make a a um, what's the word I want to say observation. I'll make an observation. Tell me, four hundred people are living on the streets, are in cars, are in abandoned buildings. Fifty-one percent of that are African American or Black. Now that is roughly 202 people. Out of that 202 people, about 78 are black men. Because it's are, a, a men. So I would say black men. So that's about 160 people out of the 400 that are living on the streets of black men. So that's about 160, 40%. Okay, 40% 40 of the people on the street are black men. And a couple months ago, the VA sheriffs police chief, uh, our law enforcement agencies, they were always saying how, how 90%, high 80s, mid to low 90% are uh, a, a black men that's incarcerated in the city, that's, uh, that, that the DA prosecutes, that the sheriff house. So I just wanna make a, 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 a observation, is there a correlation between the amount of black, people, black men that, that go to jail that that are arrested, that are prosecuted, and that end up homeless, is is that just a coincidence, or is that really a connection between between the two? Is that really a, what was your is last? It, is it a connection, or is this oh, that a coincidence? Like the majority of the people that are arrested and prosecuted are and are are in jail are black men, and yeah. the majority of the people that are homeless are black men. Yeah, and, and if that's the case. I, I would dare to say the street homeless by disability, and it's not a joke, your, your disability seems to be being a black man. That's what the numbers suggest. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, nationally, the data shows everywhere, and in New Orleans as well, that uh, black people are more likely than white people to be affected by homelessness. It's discrimination, it's housing discrimination, education discrimination, employment discrimination that leads us to that place. But then on the street, you also have a really high percentage of people on the street are disabled. And, um, and so that's another key factor. You also find a lot of people disabled in shelter, but the street population is more, much more disabled than the shelter population, which goes to one of the reasons why um, many people on the street can't use shelters. If you have mental illness, you may be not really able to deal with being in a congregate facility with a lot of people around you. Um, you, may, you. You may not be able to handle that. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you, if you have a substance use disorder, and I'm not going to be judgmental about that, because even though I'm a person that if I drink two drinks a year, that's a lot for me. <laughs> I'm telling you, if I were homeless, if I lost my housing, I'd be drinking too. I'd be, you know, I, I'm not going to judge people because when your life falls apart, yeah, no, I, I understand you're, you're going to, so, but if you do have an alcohol problem, for example, you're not going to be able to drink in a shelter and you're not going to be able to go out and get a drink in the middle of the night when you need one. And as much as we might like that everyone gets clean and sober, we know it's not realistic for us to think that people are gonna be able to first become clean and sober and then we house them. We have to like figure out something that works for everybody. And that's one of the beauties of non-congregate shelter when you can give someone their own space is that virtually everyone will accept that. We, the outreach team and the city and our partners all working together pulled 616 people off the street voluntarily. They didn't have to come. 30 of them chose not to come. 30, just 30 out of 616 people, out of 600 and 
46 people, 30 chose not to come because we were able to offer them their own individual unit where they had privacy and where they had the same freedom that you and I would have if we rented a hotel room. I mean, the only thing they didn't have, they had to agree to have a daily room check. So, you know, there was that, but that was the only, only limitation on their freedom. And people were willing to accept that. And it shows what we can do, you know, when we do have those resources and why we thought it was important to try to get some more non-congregate shelter resources, because particularly for people with severe mental illness, that often works better. Um, I just have a few questions. For the grants, um, I know that uh, there was a requirement for the business community to pledge some money. Um, how much did the business community pledge? Well, all together for our housing fund, we raised $569,000 in pledges. We didn't have a whole lot of time to do it. Um, and, you know, um, Greater New Orleans Inc. Uh, and uh, New Orleans and Company both, um, you know, came up with substantial pledges as did uh, the Greater New Orleans Foundation, um, United Way, and a lot of other partners. Um, uh, Jones Walker made a nice uh, pledge. Um, and, uh, you know, a shout out to the business community and everyone who stepped up to work on that. There was very little time to put it together and $14 million in total leveraging. The healthcare community, Auctioner, LCMC, Tulane, mm -hmm. every FQHC in town, I think, um, stepped up. Odyssey House, Louisiana is, has committed to provide substance use treatment services for every single person on the street who will accept it. You know, we uh, Crescent Care, No AIDS Task Force, they stepped up in a big way and our providers, our providers um, stepped up. And, I, and here is a really important opportunity to say, we would not have been able to leverage that much if it weren't for Medicaid expansion. And that's actually one of our advantages in this competition compared to many of the other states in our region that don't have Medicaid expansion, they will not be able to leverage what we were able to leverage because the vast majority of people on the street do not have Medicaid. And in a state that does not have Medicaid expansion, like Mississippi, Texas, Florida, um, they, they, the only way that they can get Medicaid for their clients is first by going through the SSI process, which can take years and you can never get it sometimes. Oftentimes you never get it. And so we have the advantage that we can sign up our clients for Medicaid just like that because they're poor. That's the only requirement. And because of that, we're able to leverage, we ask all these healthcare facilities just to estimate, agree to take on a certain number of clients for primary care or whatever it is that they were willing to do for them and just estimate what the Medicaid billing would be. And we were able to come up with a tremendous amount of leveraging that way, which so everyone pray that that application is successful because it would be a game changer for our community. I, but I don't want anyone to count on it because it's yeah still tough. And, and I appreciate that, Martha. I mean, I, get, I guess my point is just this. We get a lot of complaints in my office about folks who are, are living under the Calliope um, and people in the business community. And there's opportunity for the yes. business community to actually step yes. up. Um, and donate because you guys are a nonprofit to yes. unity, to efforts of unity, to yeah. efforts of whatever organization that they choose that are nonprofits in order to help some of the folks off the streets that they're complaining about. So I just, I, yeah. I want to I make that point yeah. while the media is here and, and I, on the I, public I, record. And if I could just respond to that. So while this was in process, I got email, and I'm sure all of you were on the same email chain by some people, some business folks downtown complaining about homelessness. And I said, well, here's something you can do. You can make a pledge and you don't even have to pay the pledge unless we get this grant, but you, but we need actually your paper pledge to submit in the application. And um, uh, only, only one, only one uh, business stepped up um, from that email. But there's um, a, there's a, <sighs> listen, it's 400 people. 
not a lot of money. Yeah. And the business community, you know, as they're impacted by this, and I, and I understand, I get it. I work downtown. We all work downtown. But there are opportunities to just make a difference by donating. Right. And that money will get into the hands of somebody who needs the help. Yeah. Um, through your nonprofit, through other nonprofits, whatever nonprofit they choose to donate to. Yeah. On that point, I know we had questions about women and children shelters. There are opportunities like Hope House, for example, where women and children can go. What are other opportunities for women and children who are unhoused? Um, well, any any family with children that is having a um, housing crisis should call our family housing crisis line, which is 504 356 1859. And um, our specialists will help that family figure out if they need to be in shelter, if there's some other solution, including, you know, some of the um, problem solving solutions I talked about before. Um, and they will, they will help that family get whatever it is that that family needs. So we urge everybody to call that number again, it's 356 1859 if you are a family with a housing crisis. Okay, and there are other uh, specific services, for example, veterans. I know the VA has a homelessness services coordinator. Um, I visited the uh, Volunteers for America House Uptown, which right. is fantastic. So for specific populations, you can connect them with services that are specific to them. For example, right. unaccompanied, unaccompanied young people can right. be Covenant House, for right. example. Exactly. And then for, for general adults that are not with children, um, the number would be the Community Resource and Referral Center, which is 658-2944. Okay. Um, I do, unless there are other comments here, I have a comment from Kim Ford and then one from Ms. Mercado. Greetings. Hi, my name is Kim Ford, and I live in the Lower Ninth Ward, but I've tried to help so many people suffering with homelessness over the years. And so from that, I come to you now to say, and to the council, to say that there are several different terms that are being talked about here, like uh, terms like unhoused, street homelessness, shelter slash unsheltered homelessness, et cetera. And I, because I helped a lady who was uh, living on the street and she was living on the street in front of some wealthy guy in the neighborhood who told her that she could park her car there in front of her street. But oh, unity, did not consider her homeless because she was in front of this man's door on and her she stepped in her car, you know, but it's been just so difficult for me to communicate with unity. There is no transparency. They don't answer their phones. Oh my God, like never ever, never ever. You leave a message, you never ever get a return phone call. And this is my first time even seeing you in public, um, the uh, Miss Kegel, because you're like a myth. That's me. No, the the director. What's what's your name? Angela Patterson. Patterson. Okay, deputy director, right? But I, I I tell you, trying to find you guys is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. I've gotten nowhere. I've gotten nowhere. But finally, the lady who was uh. She had a, excuse me. Sorry, y'all. She had a, uh, I got a new phone. I don't even know how to turn it off. But she had a, a breathing machine. She had, uh, she, she, but she was homeless and she had COVID during COVID. The numbers during COVID, I don't even hear nobody mentioning that anymore, but the community suffered during COVID. Hospitals would put homeless people out on the street during COVID. Ashram would put them out on the street during COVID. I know a man who had had several operations during COVID and he had to heal on the street. And they had a medical team that would 
come out and serve the homelessness. And that's how he was able to get a little bit of help. But finally, by the grace of God, I was able to get him housing shelter, but it was not through unity. And so unity is listed as our government's first line of defense for homelessness. And look, I'm not saying you ladies don't work hard because you probably are, but you guys need to reevaluate because homelessness is continuing to suffer and it's not getting any better. So if you don't have the people who are most affected before you even come up with the plan, sitting at the table, and I learned that in organizing and advocacy 101, the people are the ones, the people who are suffering, they have to be the ones that's determining the solutions for this. And I don't see that with unity. I see unity is very, I'm, I'm gonna wrap this up. Unity is very distant. And for matter of fact, this is the first time today I even heard you had a telephone number that people could call for housing. But I've, I've had so much of you, the, you know, on the front side, unity is saying one thing, then when I try to look it up, if I go call this number and leave a message and nobody calls me back, y'all gonna hear from me again, because I'm coming back again. Matter of fact, I brought somebody with me today. Ms. I brought her with me today, because I tried to help this baby find homeless. Uh, Covenant House, Ms. Ford, I really, got, I really got to get to Ms. Mercadell. Yeah, Covenant House, Covenant House is a problem. Ms. Mercadell. And just a reminder, everyone, two minutes. Hello, good evening. I'm Dominique Mercadell. I just want to say that I've been experiencing home, homelessness for about four or five years since my mom was murdered. And I've had to go to shelters, tell my story, being promised permanent supportive housing. Time after time. Time after time. And there's no outcome for me and my three children. We're promised this housing, then we're left back in the dirt saying to reach out to Unity. And I've tried and no answer, or they'll tell me I have to go to yeah. this number or that number. And it's more than that. It's hard to explain everything within two minutes. I, I, that, that's why it would be better to have a resource for someone who can actually help me and my children. I really didn't want to get up here and have to explain this because I, I, I'm just, I'm over going through expressing what's going on in my life and not getting help and a better outcome from it. And it, it, it's not doing anything but hurting me and my children. My children are traumatized from going in and out of shelters, prom getting promised help. I've had a situation where an organization promised me and my children housing. They said we'd have the housing in two weeks, permanent supportive emergency housing. And I have a recording of this, but anyways, it's been about five to six months and me and my children are still homeless with no help and no resources. And I'm just trying to figure out where to begin to continue to be a better mother for me and my children. I, I don't wanna go down the wrong path anymore because I've, I've been through a lot of things. I'm not perfect, but I do want the help. I do want the resources to be a better mother for me and my children. Thank you, Ms. Mercadell. And I think you have some good resources right here in front of you um, who will be happy to speak with you after this meeting. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, well, if, you, if you hang on then. I'll be yeah. glad to speak to you right after we finish. We'll, we'll try to get you off this uh, stage right now. We have one more comment from Ms. Davis, but uh, Ms. Mercadell, if you could just hang back and Ms. Patterson can talk to you, okay? okay. Uh, offline, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate everybody who is here today because the room is very empty in my opinion. Um, if I had my choice, there'd be a hundred homeless people behind me so they can voice their opinions in the house of the people. Most people who are homeless are scared to walk through that front door. They have bathrooms and running water in this building and they would rather use the bushes than come into this building because they are scared of government agencies and organizations that have led them in circles and astray. 
I'm very pained to watch. And as I investigate and talk to people, I feel their pain. And there's no words to describe a way to fix this. Um, as I mentioned before, I I walk into organizations looking for a way where I can help, where my voice can be directed to people who are familiar with the situation because I'm not very familiar on how I can help. And I still don't get answers. I don't get responses. If I do, it's months before I get responses. And I don't know where my time is best served besides on the street. I'm gonna end it there, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Um, thank you, Unity, uh, for all that you do. And hopefully you can speak with Ms. Mercadell. Look forward to working with you on hopefully the funding. Um, our last Hi. presenter is the DDD. I know there, excuse as me. Joe Jerusa says. Council member, excuse me, we had a few online. On how many? Six. Let's read three and put the rest on the record so we can get DDD up and out of here. Sure. First comment is from Aisha Kelly. For a little over a year, District E has seen an upswing in aggressive panhandling and residents displaying untreated mental health issues. It's my understanding that Unity has been actively placing homeless residents in the Tara Lane, Cindy Place and Crowder area. What is Unity's plan to provide the proper wraparound services in order to properly acclimate these persons into the community? Please explain as the quality of life of every resident is on the line. Next comment is from Mary Smith. On behalf of the New Orleans Task Force, on October 3rd, Rob Masson of Fox 8 News reported on our community walkthrough in New Orleans East that included Tara Lane. Mr. Masson included in his report that the NOPD crime website has reported over the past year that Tara Lane, that on Tara Lane, the following, the following, a sexual assault, two aggravated assaults, two aggravated batteries, and three three thefts. As a resident, I walk my street, including Tara Lane. I very often notice a police presence in the presence in the apartments on Tara Lane. I've also talked to residents on Tara Lane that report a considerable amount of drug-related activity. Over the past few weeks, I've stopped, I've been stopped twice by residents living on Tara Lane asking for financial assistance to buy food and medicine. Another man I stopped to talk with indicated he was so stressed out that he wanted to click out. It is obvious many residents in this area need services other than housing. What's Unity's plan to aid the needs of these residents? And the third comment is from Terrence Mealy, who says, good morning. How did it come to be that the most, most of these unhoused residents have made their way to New Orleans East and aren't receiving the adequate services they deserve? Prior to a year ago, we didn't have the issue in our district. Please elaborate on how Unity is seeking homes and places and placing these individuals, wouldn't it? make more sense if the unhoused were cl closer downtown to have easier access to the services that are provided to them. Thank you very much for those who made online comments. And um, I appreciate the patience of the representatives of the downtown development district. Thank you very much. We look forward to hearing of your presentation on your homeless initiatives and outreach update. If you will, feel free to introduce to the public um, your online um, viewership those who are here with you today. Absolutely, yep. thank you so much, Councilman Green. Uh, good afternoon, Council Members. Davon Barbour, President and CEO of the Downtown Development District. Uh, to my left is Hunter Aver, our Director of Operations. Uh, that uh, portfolio includes public safety as well as cleaning within downtown. So immediately to my right is Angela Ozarek, who is our uh, public, excuse me, our Homeless Outreach uh, Coordinator with Travelers Aid Society. And then to my far right is Donald Klaus, who is our public safety manager. Uh, and so we're delighted to be here before you today. Uh, we very much thank you for the invitation. This certainly is an important conversation for our community. Uh, as you are aware, the Downtown Development District is a property-based uh, assessment district. Uh, our mission, simply put, is to ensure that downtown is a great place to live, work, and play. We are the heartbeat for the city. We are not a gated community. We are a part of this community. And so, you know, the, having a role in this particular topic is critical to our operations. Certainly, if you're a homeowner living in downtown, you expect a great quality of life. Uh, if you're a hotelier, you expect to have a great public realm that's conducive to attracting meetings and conventions. If you're a business owner, um, you equally expect an environment that attracts customers. And so 
the downtown development district cannot bury its head in this uh, as it relates to this issue. Uh, and we're delighted to be at the table to be a partner with those to really address and reduce homelessness in our community. Um, well, you know, we work collaboratively with many uh, city departments, uh, state agencies, as well as other nonprofit providers to really make a dent in this issue. I, I would say from a funding standpoint, again, the, the special tax dollars that are generated really go towards, I would say, three external uh, com components of our work program, economic development, public safety, as well as cleaning. Uh, and so with respect to public safety, here's where I think our work really intersects. Uh, as an organization, we have a fundamental commitment to second chance hiring. Uh, so many of the men and women that you see cleaning downtown, formerly incarcerated, formerly homeless individuals, that is something that is really, really important to us. We want to make sure that we're providing a vehicle for individuals to get back on their feet. Um, our team members do everything from litter removal. Sometimes we're even called in to deal with biohazards and special cleaning. I'll give you an example. Recently, uh, we had a call from a hotel where there had been an encampment that formed uh, just outside the hotel in the rear. And so we went in, did some tactical cleaning, uh, brought in our homeless outreach services as well to provide some support to mitigate those issues. And so that's just another example uh, as it relates to cleaning where our, where, where our work intersects. Uh, additionally, public safety rangers, um, we do have civilian personnel that work tirelessly each uh, every single day. They work from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., providing uh, information to tourists, to visitors, uh, providing safety walks, and also providing homeless outreach as well. You know, so sometimes throughout the day, as an organization, we may receive calls from a business about someone camped out in front of an establishment or, or a location. And our rangers work collaboratively with Travelers Aid Society, you'll hear from very shortly, and also some of our partners. I, I will say that the collaboration with the uh, health department, Dr. Vegno and her team has been phenomenal. Um, the resource of having the uh, sobering uh, center, an additional resource that has just been phenomenal, phenomenal to our public safety rangers. Um, our, our rangers come to me all the time, singing the praises, being able to get someone who's um, intoxicated on the streets, get them into a place where they can get better, get some food uh, and, and be productive again. So resources like that are also uh, critical to our operations. Um, you heard, I know there was some discussion earlier as well related to the low barrier shelter. Again, as an organization, we, we have a broad portfolio, but we understand that we have to have a strong economic base. And so we have to address housing. Um, we looked at best practices around the country. I can tell you, homeless is a top issue for many of our peers around the country. Uh, we just convened several weeks ago meeting with other downtown districts, and this is a, a hot priority for, for us. Several years ago, uh, the downtown development district looked at best practices around the country, and after visiting the city of San Antonio, we saw that they had developed a low barrier shelter. And so we came back, worked with other funders in this community, the convention center, the city's community development department, uh, department and others to fund the operations of the low barrier shelter. So initially we had put up about a million dollars to aid with the construction of that facility. And then we entered into a five-year funding agreement that began in 2018, where we provide $500,000 annually. Uh, most recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, our board of directors approved our 2023 operating budget, where we've set aside funds to fulfill the final year of that funding agreement. And then finally, I would also address, again, outreach. Again, our portfolio is pretty broad. It's important for us to connect with the individuals, the organizations that are, that are the experts. And so we have, uh, since 2014, partnered with the Travelers Aid Society uh, to conduct homeless outreach. And so momentarily, you will hear from Angela Ozarek, um, who's really out there pounding the pavement, meeting with individuals, and she can share some insight uh, into her work. Um, and then I would just also point out as well, again, you heard a lot from, uh, from the Unity team. I would like to disclose, I am a new member of the Board of Directors of Unity. Uh, we were proud to also serve on the uh, community task force to reduce street homelessness. Again, this was such a big issue. Uh, we convened uh, the State of Downtown luncheon a couple of weeks ago, and we've made a direct ask of the business community. It really requires all hands on deck. This is a complex issue that will require the participation of everyone. Uh, and so with that, I'm just going to pass the baton to Angela Ozarek of our team to just share some insight in terms of what she sees on a daily basis. Hi, good afternoon. So I can speak about my time in this role. I've been in this role for four years. I've been doing direct homeless services for about 10 years. 
um, on a yearly basis, this role, which I've just been one outreach worker for the past four years serving the downtown development district, going out every day, interfacing, making sure that people downtown have not only information about where to get resources, but that for those among the unsheltered population whom information is not enough, that they have a direct guiding hand through the process. So I am a social worker. I work directly with those who are, sometimes people use the term frequent flyers. We like to think those most affected by marginalized identities and adverse life experiences. I do the entire process with them on the sidewalk, in the doorways, in the public library, in Duncan Plaza. We're applying to food stamps, to social security, to housing. My agency, Travelers Aid Society as a whole, is part of the Unity Continuum of Care. So I connect folks to resources, not only at my own agency, but at agencies around the city. Um, in 2020, um, which was as far back as I pulled the data from today, though we have it in general, housed 82 individuals um, through my role and got 62 into treatment. In 2021, housed 74 individuals, 46 into treatment. Though the average for the last five years of this program in general um, is about 90 people a year into housing just through one outreach worker. And as Martha said earlier with Unity, there's just not enough outreach workers in this city. So I know that the DDD and also partners in the French Quarter um, using this model of a neighborhood specific outreach want to expand outreach um, in the city. And I know a commenter said something earlier about it seems, and it might have been an online comment, there's so many services focused in the tourist areas and the business areas. And I do think that there should be coordinated street outreach network through the city um, as there are in many other cities. And my agency has actually used the success of the DDD model to separately find funding. Now we have an outreach worker on the non-DDD side of Calliope, as well as in the Marini Bywater and Seventh Ward. Um, so this model also helps my agency and agencies like it when it succeeds, we can replicate the model elsewhere. But I also wanted to highlight in this year alone, just in 2022, I have spoken to 175 unique individuals. So with the overall number that there may be close to 400 individuals living on the streets of New Orleans at any given time this year, about this summer, already 10 months into the year, I've spoken to 175 different ones. So it also indicates that many of these individuals are centered in the downtown and business areas. Um, so yeah, I, I love this work, I think. Um, I've long been interested in homelessness, long you know, been affected by situations like homelessness in my own family. And I think one thing that I think really needs highlighting that many people have highlighted already, but what I have seen different in, in this past year of doing this work is just the shortage of affordable, accessible, and safe housing. At the beginning of 2022, I started tracking in the monthly data I give to the DDD, how many people am I talking to who already have what I call voucher in hand. It means they're off the Section 8 waitlist, the voucher is in their hand. I have helped them or someone else has helped them get a Unity voucher and the voucher is in their hand, but there is nowhere for them to rent at the voucher price, which as of October 1st just went up to over $1,000, but previously was $9.27. If you look at the rental market, there are very few. In the months of January through September, obviously October is not done, um, there have sometimes been as many as 30% of the people I talk to in a given month that I happen to run into downtown or that I'm continuing work with because they're already one of my personal clients already have vouchers in their hand. And I think, you know, our agency and the DDD both supported Unity in their bid for more vouchers. But I would echo previous concerns about using ARPA funding to actually build an increase in rental stock housing. Because while my role and many other social workers like me and the DDD public safety rangers can assist people with the process of being approved to get a voucher in their hand. Um, if there's nowhere for them to rent with that voucher, their time spent homelessness, sp time spent experiencing homelessness will continue. Having a voucher in hand with nowhere to rent um, does not end your homelessness. So just really, and that's something I've been very grateful to Davon and the team at the DDD to really hear about what can we do to not just leverage more outreach, more social services, that at the end of the day, as so many people have said, housing ends homelessness. And I think tracking this number of how many people already have a voucher in hand, in theory, their homelessness could be ended today if we just had a place for them to rent. So, but I'm happy. I'm happy to answer any questions. You do a million different things in this job. Yeah. I do have a question because I don't want to forget it, but how do you place 90 people a year in housing? So it's a definitely a collaborative effort. So those are folks whom I have personally 
had my hands on, had my eyes on. Many of them, I do the application myself. So I, through doing this work, can certify that they are homeless under HUD standards. I help them through the application. They get referred to Unity, which acts as the city's coordinated entry funnel by being the COC lead. So they consider all the applications for housing. And then they find appropriate housing programs, which also exist at my agency, at Unity, at other agencies. Um, and then, you know, we help them get matched to the voucher. We help them meet with their voucher provider, whether it's Section 8. We help them get the unit inspected for HANO. Um, if it's a PSH program, Permanent Supportive Housing, we make sure that they have a very warm handoff with that new caseworker. We drive them to see apartments. We help them get furniture. So it's, I, I don't have 90 units of rental housing at my disposal. Rather, I am meeting with people who absent an outreach worker would not be able to navigate this process because there is a lot of paperwork involved. There's a lot of difficulties. About, as others have said, there's distrust of government officials, of bureaucracies. I have clients who are banned from every shelter in the city, banned from social security, banned from food stamps. So they need someone who can literally walk them through the process and I serve as that person for them. Um, so it's, but it's navigating a bunch of different things. It also represents people whom we reconnect with their families um, and assist them in moving back home. It includes people that we assist in moving into group homes, though I would like to say there are no fully licensed group homes in Orleans Parish currently, except for one that is intended for people exiting the forensic setting. Um, so, but it includes group home move-ins, senior housing move-ins, family reunifications, and navigation of the unity housing system as well. Or obtaining job for fair market housing, though I will say that continually represents less of our work over time as the gap between wages and housing prices increases. That becomes very difficult to help someone who starts off with nothing on the street bridge that gap. So you're not putting people into housing. I mean, it's into, into shelters. You mean like that's, apartments? That's housing. No, they are not homeless any longer is what that number. That number does not represent move-ins into shelter, though we do frequently engage and encourage people around shelter. This number is ending their homelessness. And I would just add, you know, Council Member Green, hopefully you can hear, you know, someone who's passionate. A passion, that's what I'm saying. I mean, we need to have more passion. That's 90 people that she's found housing for. And we're saying that we have 400 in the city. Yes, we need to replicate your services. I will but I'm also, trying to get to the yeah. bottom of how we do this. So basically what you said to me is that there was a statistic that says that two out of three people don't want, or they don't want, they don't want shelters, but they would mm -hmm. like housing. Got you. Yeah. And so I would, I would go. emphasize so that they're, and that not, housing they're is not section the same housing. offer. But no, yeah. no, no, wait, but yeah. look, I, I agree that I need to use the correct wording and that's why we have this hearing today mm -hmm. so for example let's just say hypothetically there were vouchers available to people to the housing authority the kind of work that you do with passion is to help them to go through that process and find a unit through the inspection mm -hmm. and the like mm -hmm. yes it is though i will say it's important to highlight as well that number i've given of how many people have voucher in hand i cannot predict the future for the next several months but i will not be surprised if the total housings yielded from my own position is more like 50 to 55 this year, partly because there is just no housing available for the people who have vouchers in hand. So compared to some years, almost a half reduction, not because I'm out there less, not because people are less interested, but simply because there is no housing to rent at the voucher price. So replicating my position may help some, but it would be limited in efficacy without also increasing the affordable housing stock. Okay, it takes a long time to build new housing. Indeed, I mean, yeah. I, I, I can't use that as the solution. I mean, I've been mm -hmm. involved with development projects from the time that you apply, you get involved with the Housing Authority, Louisiana mm -hmm. Housing Agency, the various entities that are involved with it, it. It gets to the point where you're just almost keeping up, if not with falling behind. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Yeah. I appreciate your work. Of course. I would also like to note that in our recently approved 2023 operating budget, we'll be funding an additional homeless outreach a worker position, again, to supplement Angela's work. Okay. Well, thank you all for um, all the work that you do. It's always good to see you. Um, I, yeah, I, I wanted to highlight the fact that you are actually hiring another Angela to help, help with uh, outreach. And it sounds like if we could, you know, if you're touching 90 people, we need like five more of you to touch everybody um, in addition to the folks that um, Unity is helping. Um, I did wanna ask a question about housing uh, to Council Member Green's point. I read or listened to an, uh, 
a news report on NPR about Norfolk, Virginia, who's doubling Norfolk, Virginia, where they're doubling up people into roommate housing. So when you're talking about housing, are you looking for single bedrooms with a single bath? Or are you looking, are there roommate situations that you can help people with? It's entirely dependent on the person's situation. Like I said, this includes moving people into group homes, into their families' homes, into fair market housing, or into voucher-sponsored housing. Uh, many single individuals, as we are talking, most unsheltered homelessness in the city of New Orleans is represented by single individuals, will be awarded a one-bedroom voucher. I know Unity and other agencies around the country have looked at models where, due to the shortage of housing, two one-bedroom voucher holders are encouraged to link up and become roommates. Um, that's not impossible. It's certainly less common here, but I know it's something that is being talked about as an exploration of of the shortage of affordable housing, what can we do? Can we encourage roommates? Um, can we do other things? And at the same time, for some folks who don't wanna live in congregate shelter, even um, putting two folks together may not be something that they would choose, but we often explore any possible route to housing. And like I said, unfortunately, um, things like fully licensed group homes, fully licensed nursing homes, we are short on all those things in this region of the state, um, but we, Generally, I generally find that people will accept most forms of housing rather than homelessness. Um, and by and large, they have tried options and only left them under duress. They've left a group home or a nursing home or a family home because it was a very difficult situation, not because it was an easy decision to make. So we explore all options, including roommates, but to formalize a two individuals, each using vouchers, living in the same home, also in involves negotiation with landlords. There's a thing called master leasing where the agency would lease um, with the landlord directly. That way tenants could move out in, in and out easier. That probably Unity could speak to more directly, but it's all it's all an exploration. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if two people have $1,000 each, you can probably maybe more easily find a, a two bedroom place for $2,000, but then, you know, it's the deposit and willing landlords who are yeah. willing to house people who are formerly yeah. on the street. Willing landlords and willing participants. I know I went to the National Alliances conference several months ago who talked about, you know, some cities exploring like a match service who matches people up, but also keeping in mind if one, if one tenant begins to fall behind on rent, you don't want both tenants penalized. So just, it requires some logistic forethought into making it safe, secure, and a preferential option for everyone. Yeah. I mean, the Norfolk model literally had the separate roommates enter into separate lease agreements with mm -hmm. the, so if somebody didn't yeah. live up to their, what yeah. they needed to do, they could get rid of that person and not the other. Um, I just think there are options for us to explore, including potentially um, acquiring something that's already built. Like a motel. Like a hotel, motel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that we can then repurpose, like Hope House, which is a lovely. Yeah, place. and I, I echo Unity and the health department as well, that not only here, but nationally, you do see a lot of success in those models so, of repurposing buildings into things that used to exist in the housing stock in general and don't often anymore, like SRO setups. So I'll say again publicly on the record, if there's any business person out there who has or would like to donate a hotel or a piece of property, the city would be happy to take it. Um, and give it to a nonprofit to build some housing so that we can get folks off the street. Um, and it is an economic driver, Davon. I mean, it, you know, we're talking about people coming in for conventions and stepping over people, et cetera, et cetera. This is an economic problem um, that the business community should be trying to solve um, so that we can have a place that provides a quality of life for business owners, visitors to New Orleans. Do you disagree? No, absolutely, 100%. Right. Um, okay, so I do have two comments. Janet, I know you've been here for a while. Good to see you. Hi, council members, thanks so much. Um, so Janet Hayes, I'm with Healing Minds NOLA. Uh, the target population that we deal with are people with untreated and undertreated serious mental illness. They make up uh, about 4% of the population of America, but are way overrepresented in the populations of homelessness in jails and in the never ending revolving doors of psychiatric hospitals. So I think, you know, obviously we need to really address the, where the backlog is happening 
And for that, we need all stakeholders at the table. So I appreciate all the work that everybody here is doing. Um, we need to always remember that the homeless population is not homogenous, right? There are various different segments uh, and groups amongst the homeless population that need different levels um, of services and different types of care. So for me, again, it's people with untreated, undertreated serious mental illnesses, half don't know that they're sick because they lack insight as part of the disease that prevents them from knowing that they're sick. So if you ask them if they have a mental illness or want services, they will say, no, you are the one that needs help. I'm Jesus, right? And so this is a real, now we do, there are modalities of treatment and care that can help these folks, but number one, they must be stabilized and to, to get them stabilized, they need to be in treatment that cycles back to the long term treatment, you know, the facilities that Jennifer Avigno referenced earlier. There is efforts at the federal level to repeal a, a federal Medicaid um, exclusion, which is discriminatory that discriminates against care Medicaid reimbursing uh, facility site facilities for long term care. However, there is a state waiver that the state could apply for to go around that federal barrier so that we could start we could get funding for up to 60 days in an inpatient facility. And uh, there's some caveats that go along with that. So the state doesn't like it, but waiting for the federal government to repeal an exclusion so that unlimited federal dollars will rain down from the sky for Louisiana to take to keep people in hospitals forever is probably not going to happen. And I actually dis I agree with the disability rights advocates that it shouldn't happen because what we need is for then somewhere to discharge to to keep them from going back to those hospitals, right? We don't have that in place. We could do it for, you know, two to four million dollars in this state. We could implement mental health IOP, which would, you know, be what CMS wants in order for the state to apply for that subsidy. So um, I just, again, I think it's really important. We have the right stakeholders at the table, the point in time count in January, you know, every city does it all around the country. You have people going out with clipboards and they're asking, they're serving people on the street. But here, here's the thing, for people that don't know they're sick because they have a serious mental illness, even though they are sick, if you ask them if, what they need and if they need help and all of these other questions, they're going to say no. So it's not going to show up in the census as this is a person with serious mental illness. And I honestly believe that the population out there is a lot larger than what's being recorded simply for that reason. We need really skilled social workers, people who have expertise, who can recognize symptoms and signs, who do these surveys so that we can get good data. And there are other areas we need to get good data to. And I would like to have you know, more conversations with all of you um, so that I can bring in, you know, my uh, knowledge and my sort of expertise in this dealing with this particular population. There are ways to go around political barriers. I'm all for that. You know, if you can't scale the wall, go around it, right? That's what I did with AOT. When we started assisted outpatient treatment with Judge Reese, we started with no funding. And the reason I did it is because I couldn't get buy-in from the agencies that we needed buy-in from, you know, from to start. So I went to Judge Reese, I said, if we don't do this, nobody's going to start it. And he said, okay, let's do it. And I just left his office. We have, we have I, I don't know how many people on the docket for tomorrow, at least 20. We have a caseload of almost 30 now. We, I mean, it is exploding. We are getting so many referrals. We just really started getting rolling in March because we had to change the law. If that is any indication of the need that's out there, and these are families mostly, we can't help people who are homeless. You know, if they have nowhere to go, first of all, we can't get them served with petitions to, a, to attend court. And we can't get them, we can't provide them services if we don't have a location for them. But they need well-managed, supportive, supervised housing. Without that, they can't take care of the properties on their own and they won't stay. So that's what we really need to work on. And that I think is really, if we could make one investment, that would be the one that would make the big difference because they are the most visible, right? There's a lot of home people that are, are homeless and some are just poor. I might be one of them one day. But I'll tell you what, we are all the shopping cart lady at the end of the day, because if I have a psychotic break, I know what's going to happen to me. And it's, it's horrific. It gives me nightmares. I need an advanced psychiatric directive so that I can make sure that if I have a psychotic break, that I will be held and medicated and brought back to sanity so that I, you know, so that I can, so that I can live my life. Because, but what happens is that doesn't happen. You go into the hospital, they don't treat you. And you stay psychotic, you're out. And what happens then, right? And that is, doesn't matter how much money you have, that's happen, happening to everybody. It's not, about, it's not always about money. 
Thank you. It's a lot. I know. Thank you for your patience. And I know we're going to work together in the future on this. Um, Ms. Davis, you have a comment card? Hi. Um, I was planning on being here today, regardless of what the subject matter was, and it just happened to be on homeless. Oh. Um, I just happened to walk into Duncan Plaza that day, and it took me weeks to figure out that DDD was responsible for the property. Um, I walked into the mayor's office first. Um, I reached out to many directors in the building, and it's difficult for me to navigate on who can address change and support. And I feel close to what they're feeling as a sense of hopelessness. Um, I spent weeks in Duncan Plaza while the guards would come and skirt the property, um, not wanting to get into the bushes because they didn't have the proper um, PPE to get into bushes that had heroin needles in it. Um, I was told that you can make more money at McDonald's than being paid as a ranger for the downtown development district. And every day I spent down there, there was just more information that was just really unsettling for me to hear. And the more I reached out, the less information I got. There was no person for me to talk to. Um, and I'm concerned that money is an issue, but I've spent very little money helping many people in the last couple months. I don't see how that's an issue. I don't see how getting out on the streets and talking to people cost anything. Um, I've been in contact with some people from the DDD and I'm left bewildered as to what the solution will be because change has to happen in order for prosperity to ensue. Um, I pointed out that the bushes wouldn't be so dirty if there were restrooms in the park. Um, it's not just homeless people that use the bathrooms in the park, it was people waiting on the bus. So I was also in contact with RTA uh, who was willing to help but they don't know how to help either. Uh, I don't know who else to turn to because I feel like I don't get enough time to speak with anybody who's got more information than me that can set programs up and set organizations. I talked to the leader of Ozanam, the program director, and you know he was a homeless advocate. And then once he started his organization, he's kind of stuck in one place and can't get back out on the street again. So. I think everybody needs to take a minute to realize what they can do for free because money is not an issue. Caring and compassion is abundant and the people that are on the streets are abundant. I don't think the count is, is, lot, is the right count. Um, some people in Duncan Plaza were waiting for weeks on a letter of homelessness. I don't know if you even need one of those letters to be counted or not but the guards said that they would bring a letter of homelessness that day and nothing ever happened. Um, from what I'm hearing, there's very little outreach specialists. RTA says they have one. Um, I know y'all have one too. And from what I'm, it's under 10 from what I hear, under 10 people that are willing to walk the streets. Ms. Davis, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap it up, but it sounds like you have the passion to really help think through some of these issues, and I'm sure um, folks will stay behind to speak with you, including myself. Thank you. All right. Are there any online comments? Yes, we have two. All right, let's go ahead. First comment is from Jonathan Hill, representing bakery condominiums. Says the homeless are congregated in New Orleans because the city of New Orleans allows them to be here. The homeless community on Calliope and Chapachillas can get plenty of food and social services if they would take them. Many, if not a majority of homeless community do not want any assistance or housing. They wanna live on the streets and under the bridges where the only law 
is the law of survival and they can abuse illegal drugs and alcohol. The homeless get money by panhandling and by petty to serious criminal activity. Let's cut off the supply of money by banning panhandling in the city. Suitable signs should be put on every corner on Calliope between Convention Boulevard and Loyola and on Chapitulas from Calliope to um, Melton Mead stating, it is illegal to panhandle in the city of New Orleans. Please do not give money or food to panhandlers. There are plenty of, there are plenty of city provided social services available to them. Giving them money does not help, end quote. Next comment is from Casey Davis on behalf of homeless communities. The homeless need access to fresh potable water, restroom, shower facilities and shelter, public spaces and city state properties have become the free available space for such individuals to pop up shelters. Germany and China have set an example of introducing sleeping pods in public spaces to accommodate the need for a shelter during harsh conditions, as well as public restrooms for sanitation. Duncan Plaza has a dog park, benches, a few light lamp posts and a covered pavilion in disrepair. The space is in need of restoration and transformation to meet the modern day needs and wants of the individuals that traverse this space. This is a large space and can accommodate a sleeping pod pilot program. Our plans in action to transform our public spaces to promote the general welfare of the homeless as well as serve the public and with power, lighting, security, sanitary facilities, seating and shelter as well as recreational green space. All right, I wanna thank you all for hanging in there and, and speaking to us about all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much for what you do. Um, and can we actually move to adjourn or do we just <laughs> step on out? I think I'm gonna move Council Member Green in a second. I'll second. All right, let's adjourn. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for your presentation.